Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Before I call the meeting to order, uh, I had three biopsies in three burn places Friday. It took me longer to bandage to get here than I anticipated, so I apologize. Uh, but I do have an excuse. It may be a lame excuse, but I have an excuse. <laughs> Is that a pun? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> and I am not under oath. Okay. Uh, these in order. Uh, Mr. Clash. Yes, sir. You have the honor. Uh, please join me in prayer, please. Dear Lord, thank you for another wonderful day that you have created. And dear Lord, give us the strength and wisdom to do the business for the citizens of Alamance County today. And dear Lord, we know that all things are possible through you. Hmm. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm not sure who the cookie's from, but thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't want nothing. <laughs> Do we have a motion as to the agenda? Motion to approve. Second. In discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. That's unanimous. We do have an adjustment to the agenda, Chairman. I'm sorry, there's a note on your agenda that there was an adjustment needed to the agenda. It was approved a little faster than I could interject, but items 7i and 7j are public hearings and we're not labeled as such, so they would need to be moved up to item 7A and B after your consent agenda if you wish to do the public hearings before the information presentations. So we need a modification of, which, anybody? Motion to approve as, mod, as amended. Yeah, no, I second. You second, you all in favor of the amended agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Again, thank you. Thank you. Okay, it is truly an honor. We have four separate proclamations. Now, I've never been in a meeting where we had four separate proclamations in one meeting. Um, and at this point, we're gonna bring um, Mr. Holt. Mr. Holt is not present today. All right, who's going to make the presentation? Gene, Minister Gene Boswell and Joseph Ferguson. Excellent. If you both would come to the podium and tell us who you are, and then we're going to uh, have a vote on the proclamation. Sure. Uh, my name is Joseph Ferguson. I am the legislative coordinator for 
the Concerned Bikers Association. I'm Minister Gene Boswell. I'm the chaplain with the Concerned Bikers Association. We're proud to receive this proclamation. This proclamation for May is very important to the community. It's very important to the state of North Carolina. Uh, it's very important because I was run over in July uh, by a lady who said she didn't see me. Uh, that's a very common statement. Uh, it's not just about me, it's about the state of North Carolina and the bikers in the state of North Carolina about being seen. Uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, Joe's got a statement here about a biker that was killed. Yes, I'd just like to mention his name. His name was Brad Reed and he lost his life on Route 87. He was in broad daylight. He was on his way to work in the morning and somebody did not see him and hit him. And subsequently after that, a second vehicle ran over him and he lost his life. Mm -hmm. Just a gentleman who was a productive member of society, just trying to take care of his family and go to work. And, uh, he, you know, we would really like to uh, uh, make that this month uh, with uh, Biker Safety Awareness to remember Brad's name, Brad Reed. We need to remember that all bikers are not bad. Uh, the American Motorcycle Association says 99% of American bikers are good bikers. Only 1% are bad. Thank must you. must uh, keep I, in mind, I, I'm sorry. I would guess more than 1% of the general population is bad. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we must keep in mind that, you know, even when we're sitting at a traffic light and there's a biker next to us, it could be your lawyer, your doctor, your dentist, anyone. I think Stephen Carter said one time he did ride, I think. I did. So, thank you very okay. much. My glasses are sitting in my office, so I'm going to have Vice Chair Carter read the uh, pro Well, before we read it, we need to take a vote board on passing this proclamation. You have all seen it. It was in your packet. I'll make the motion to approve the proclamation. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Now, it's official. <clears throat> Mr. Carter. Whereas, whereas, as more and more residents are turning to motorcycles as a form of transportation, and with the warmer weather approaching, it is time to remind property owners to do their part to keep grass clippings and yard debris off the roadways and encourage drivers to be alert and share the road with a motorcycle, motorcyclist and other types of small vehicles. And whereas the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Motorcycle Safety have named Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month and May is traditionally the time that the number of motorcycles on the road increases. And whereas motorcycle riding is not only a popular form of recreation and transportation, for thousands of citizens across North Carolina and Alamance County, but an economical means of transportation that reduces fuel consumption and road wear, helps to alleviate traffic and parking congestion, and whereas North Carolina has over 189,000 registered motorcycles and more than 180,000 licensed drivers who have either a motorcycle endorsement or a motorcycle learner's permit, and whereas across the state in 2021, there were 3,712 motorcycle-related crashes that resulted in 210 fatalities and 2,847 mo motorcyclists seriously injured. And, whereas it is important that the citizens of North Carolina and Alamance County be aware of motorcycles on our roadways and recognize the importance of motorcycle safety and share the roadways, and Whereas the safe operation of a motor vehicle is enhanced through a combination of rider training and experience, good judgment, a knowledge of traffic laws and licensing requirements, and the use of highly visible safety gear, and whereas several organizations, <clears throat> such as the Alamance County Concerned Bikers Association, the North Carolina Motorcycle Safety Education Program, and other state and local motorcycle clubs and riding social clubs are committed to increasing the safe operation of motorcycles by promoting rider safety education programs. And whereas Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month is designed to increase public awareness about motorcycles and safely sharing the road with motorcycles, 
and to encourage their safe and proper use among motorcycle riders. And now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month in Alamance County, North Carolina, and urge all citizens to join in this effort to promote awareness, mutual respect, and safety on the roads. This the first day of May, 2023. Signed by John Paisley and our clerk, Tori Frank. Thank, Thank you, guys. And we appreciate you and what you're doing this evening. Thank y'all very much. We appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Okay, Eric Henry. Mr. Henry is not here today, but we are breaking ground from the Alamance Chamber. All right, would you please come forward? Well, I think we've seen you before. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Uh, I'm Reagan Garrell, President and CEO of the Alamance Chamber, and it is my pleasure to be with you all today on May 1st, uh, kicking off Small Business Week. Um, in addition to myself, we have Stephanie Williams, our Director of Small Business and Entrepreneurial Development, uh, David Putnam, our Senior Director of Economic Development, and Fadicia Lewis, the Director of the Alamance Community College Small Business Center. And David, you can come forward. Right? The whole team is here today. Um, the Alamance Chamber understands the significant impact that small businesses have on our community, and we appreciate um, your willingness to elevate um, that impact uh, for Alamance County with a proclamation today. So we appreciate you. And more. Again, you have read this proclamation. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. A motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. And Mr. Carter? This one's short. <laughs> <laughs> um, Small Business Week in Alamance County, May 1 through 7, 2023. Whereas, for more than 50 years, the U.S. Small Business Administration, SBA, has celebrated National Small Business Week, which recognizes the critical contributions of America's entrepreneurs and small business owners, and whereas Small Business Week is now observed throughout the nation, and whereas we recognize the important role that small businesses play in bringing innovation, quality of life, jobs, and investments to the city, and whereas small business owners are historically leading donors to the local community through financial gifts and volunteer hours, and whereas focusing on entrepreneurial development and supporting small business small businesses provides for a stronger, more resilient economy. And now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby recognize and honor small businesses by naming the first week of May Small Business Week in Alamance County, North Carolina. Sign this day, first this the first day of May. 2023. John Paisley and Tori Frank And we thank you. Also, ACC has a small business program. So I think we also need to acknowledge that as well. Yes, thank you all so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you, John. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brenda Harris. Who's presenting the uh, proclamation for child care provider? We never got confirmation that someone would be here, so we'll try to contact them after the proclamation and the meeting and see if um, they'd like to come by and pick it up. All right, she will go ahead and present it today. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. The next item is the proclamation for child care provider appreciation day. Um, and Ms. Carter? This one you'll like as well, but it's shorter. We do. All right, every, all board members have seen this proclamation. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Excellent. 
Child Care Provider Appreciation Day, May 12, 2023. Whereas Child Care Aware of America and other organizations nationwide are recognizing child care providers on this day, and whereas child care provides a safe, nurturing place for the enrichment and development of millions of children nationwide and is a vital force in our economy, and whereas the pandemic eliminated how indispensable child care providers are for the well being and economic security of young children, families, communities, and whereas child care programs, which are mostly small businesses run and staffed predominantly by women, are still recovering from health and financial hardships stemming from the pandemic while they have continued to meet the needs of families, and whereas North Carolina recognizes that child care has been a lifetime, a lifeline for families, communities, and the economy, and as such, has provided much needed support to providers to help sustain the viability of child care. And whereas our future depends on the quality of the early childhood experiences provided to young children today, support for high quality child care represents a worthy commitment to our children's future. And now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alabama County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim May 12, 2023, as Child Care Provider Appreciation Day in Alamance County, North Carolina, and urge all citizens to recognize child care providers for their important work. Signed this the first day of May, 2023, by John Paisley and Tori Brady. And we thank everyone that's a child care provider. And I, I would assume that includes all mothers, right? <laughs> they may not be out of classroom, but whatever. Okay, uh, the last proclamation, uh, one of the most important, <coughs> Uh, as proclamation for the 2023 Clerks Week. Um, everyone's read the proclamation. I move that we approve it. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. This one is not short. This one is not short. <laughs> Tori, we blame you for that. <laughs> well, well, actually, you can't blame me because... Tori, should you not be here up front? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, you actually can blame me because what happened was um, going through my electronic documents, I had found a 1992 proclamation that the Alamance County Commissioners had um, approved in honor of Clerks Week. So I sent that copy to our County Clerks Association president and immediate um, past president and so they liked it she, <laughs> she took it and revised it and that's why it's so long <laughs> state uh, if all of us know who you are but for those out in TV land uh, state your name and your position and your credentials Tori Frank Alamance County Clerk to the Board of County Commissioners and I have my Master Municipal Clerk my North Carolina Master County Clerk Certification, and I serve as the International Institute of International Got it backwards. International Institute of Municipal Clerks Region Three Director. And if you walk in her office, there are plaques everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> she does a great job Absolutely. keeping us straight, folks. Let me tell you, all of her. She has a really big stick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, proclamation clerk to the boards of county commissioners week april 30 through may 6 2023 whereas it is imperative to the democratic process that a well-informed citizenry participate in the operation of their local government and whereas the office of the clerk of to the board provides the communication link between the citizens the local governing body and the administrative departments local government partners and whereas the position of the clerk is one of the oldest in local government, dating at least to biblical times, and whose term has long been associated with the written word. So it is that modern day clerk are official record keepers for their counties and, whereas North Carolina law requires every board of county commissioners to appoint a clerk, and the clerk continues in that position at the pleasure of the board, and, whereas the clerk's most significant statutory duties concern the preparation, filing, and safeguarding of local government records, but the statutory duties constitute only a portion of that 
what that clerk does. And whereas the clerk, play, the clerk plays a vital role in county government and provides a written record needed to ensure that the board is accountable to the county citizens and to other public and private officials. And whereas the clerk is sometimes described as the hub of the wheel in local government because of the central work that the clerk plays in the government's co communication network. And whereas as local government becomes larger and more complicated, the clerk's role as a professional dispassionate provider of information to citizens, government officials, and the media becomes more and more important. And whereas clerks have the opportunity to participate in the North Carolina Association of County Clerks, a very active professional association of public officials dedicated to improving the professional competency of clerks through regular regional and statewide educational opportunities. And whereas in cooperation with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Government and the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, the North Carolina Association of County Clerks helps to sponsor a nationally recognized examination-based certification program that culminates in receipt of the designation of certified certified municipal clerk and whereas in addition the North Carolina Association of County Clerks and the School of Government sponsor state certification programs leading to the designation of North Carolina Certified County Clerk as well as opportunities for experienced clerks to obtain the continuing professional education needed to remain state certified or to earn an, an advanced master clerk designation and whereas in addition to conducting educational programs, the North Carolina Association of County Clerks also direct, directly assist clerks on the job with mentoring programs to provide guidance to assist clerks in their day-to-day -day work. And whereas clerks upon their initiative participate in these certifications and education programs, including annual meetings of the North Carolina Association of County Clerks and the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, which is not only in, in, which not only improve the operation of their office, but through their achievements and awards, bring favorable publicity to the counties in which they serve. And whereas clerks are involved in the state at the state level as well as in potential legislative and other matters of interest. And whereas although clerks work for the board of commissioners, they truly provide public service. And now, therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners does recognize the week of April the 30th through May the 6th, 2023, as clerk for the Board of County Commissioners Week and extend appreciation to our clerk of the board, Tory Frank, and to all county clerks for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the county they represent. Dated this the first day of May, 2023, signed by John Paisley and by Tory Frank. <laughs> And Tori, if you'll turn around the other way and allow, allow us all to stand behind her. Cameras, do we just break? <laughs> we thank you for your excellent. Thank you, Tori, so much. Okay, we're now down to public comments. And Rudy Kasami, and that's your last yes. name. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Before you start, before we start the clock, um, the handout that he gave us has an AR-15 apparently on it, but as President Biden said, AR-14. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, it's actually an M-16. It's a, okay. It's a, yes. okay. Uh, my name is Ralph Cartassi. I live at 270 Stiller Street, uh, Meadow, North Carolina, and I am the owner of Rad Industries and Rad Ridge. Good morning. I'm deeply concerned about what's going to happen here this morning. It's been over a year. Five people who live within 1.5 miles of Rag Range came to complain about the noise from the Shree Range. At that time, the Range Protection Act, Mr. Paley said, protect us. Eight weeks ago, the same five people came back here. The same five people made wild accusations, innuendos, 
nothing substantiated, much less prove against Red Range or me for that matter. Now, one of these same five people have made it personal by sending a letter to my house addressed to my wife with more wild accusation in the windows and lies. These are people you've been listening to. I've attached a copy of it. Everyone is telling me this is not about Rad or me. Respectfully, after this letter in front of you, I beg to disagree. They target my family, my wife at home. We think we've become so, you know, excuse me. I have done everything in my power to ensure safety and compliance with Rad Range. Several commissioners came and visited along with the sheriff and found nothing wrong with the range. We think we have come so far from the torture of heretics, burning of witches, and it's all ancient history. Then before you can blink an eye, suddenly it starts all over again. The county commissioners ordered the county attorney to help them craft an ordinance, targeted and directed at Rad Range. They even took the word business out because they knew that the word was too strong to target Rad Range. Notice nothing in here about hunting. The law enforcement action all have to do with target shooting. County commissioners, villains who twirl their mustaches are easily spot. Those who clothe themselves in good deeds are well camouflaged. These right people, so much like them, will always be with us, waiting for the right climate in which to flourish to spread fear in the name of righteousness. Vigilance, county commissioners, that is the price we must pay to ensure our freedoms, and continuously pay. When the first link of the chain is forged, the first speech censored, the first thought forbidden, the first freedom denied changes is all irrelevantly. Those are words of wisdom and of warning the first time any man or woman's freedom is trodden upon. We all are damaged. And I fear that's what's going to happen here this morning. The sheriff and I already have an agreement. We stop shooting until 12 noon and we have RSOs on the range. We've done everything possible. Have we become so fearful, we were so cowed that we just create ordinances for a victim's crime to impart fear of infringement on protected right that citizens enjoy sport shooting and support the Second Amendment? County commissioners, let us not condemn citizens of Alamance County, or anyone else for that matter, to victimless laws and ordinances like you're going to go on this morning because of their love of shooting in the Second Amendment. This is the government our founding fathers warned us about. Hunters are immune, but sports shooters not. Justice for some, harshly containing their rights for others. I implore you all, the end is now, like it's, it's getting to a point of madness. I have people calling my phone, sending me letters. They're upset about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. James Walker. Mr. Walker. Hi. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yeah, I'm back again. <laughs> well, it's on the trash deal. Y'all done a wonderful job of what you done before we started. But it's coming back. Jim Meyer Road, Mount Willard Road, Mel Springs Road, Salem Church Road, 54 Highway. They're coming down the road and the trash is not covered on the trucks or trailers. It's blowing off. I seen three bags on the way up here this morning. Laying on the side of the road in the trash, in the grass. Now, they go to mowing that grass, it's going everywhere. They ain't gonna stop and pick it up. I know them, the contractors. I worked for the state 30 years. I know them pretty well. And uh, DOT is using their tarps. I know that. And these contractors are using their tarps. It's these independent people coming down the road with a trailer and a pickup and they're not covering the tarps. The trash flowing out of it. They got tarps on it, but they ain't covering it. So what I'd like to see is for the landfill to start charging the people who comes in there with no tarps, charge them five, ten, twenty dollars. I don't care what you charge them. Charge them a hundred dollars. I don't care. But that they need to start charging them if they do not have a tarp over their trailer or truck. And it's blowing off coming down the road. And uh, Mr. Johnson here and his brother come down the road and by doing a good deed, they stopped and picked stuff up out of the road, keeping somebody hitting them. Well, they carried it down the landfill. 
They had charged them for dumping it. You know, the, they don't charge the state anything for dumping stuff or carrying stuff down there that they pick up. And that's the same thing. They picked it up on their own. They didn't have to stop and pick it up. Well, I heard that Mr. Hill was in California for three weeks, and when the mouse is gone, I read the mice to play, as my <laughs> dad used to say. But anyway, <clears throat> something needs to be done. Need to start charging the people, independent people, and everybody else that's coming in there with not covering the trash with the tar. Do y'all agree with that? Let me reassure you that your streets that I, well, roads I just read are not the only places where irresponsible people do stuff with trash. Yeah. Um, I seem to be the trash czar on this commissioner board for some reason. It's been my legacy. And I've gone on Union Ridge Road, I've gone out Highway 49, it's I've gone on there. Highway 87, yeah. and this is mostly at homes where hoarding just gets out of trouble. And then when you do mow on the side of the road, it looks like it goes through a shredder. Yep. And that's not something for anybody to have to go out there and pick up, yet, so to speak, little piece by piece. Um, it just goes to I will be have to apologize to you. We're not permitted under our policy to respond to speakers at this point. We can under the county commissioner comment period. And I apologize for the lack of procedure. Thank you, sir. You would do what now? I'm apologizing for our improper procedure that just took place do me a favor john next time if i'm improper stop me before i'm into the conversation okay. yeah, i'll do that thank you thank i appreciate you. your rules thank you sir so y'all can't um we can't this address off. it at this point oh okay well i know you caught me up here thanks sir all right thank you thank sorry you. thank you mr mckenzie <clears throat> Good morning. Let's me hand out some paperwork for you folks. McKenzie and I live at 2750 White Swan Drive I'm here to talk about the Rad Range and I had lived across the street from it for 40 years in the 70s it belonged to Gail and Leon Fisk 80s it was Deep Creek Plantation y'all might have eaten dinner or lunch there the 90s it was Al's Fine Food on April the, of 1994 I had my wedding uh, reception there it was Liberty Church. You look at the paperwork on page one there from 96 to 2013. Then it went back into the Powell Trust from 2013 to, two th to September of 21. During that time, it was the Lighthouse Plantation and became the 1776 Sporting Club two years ago. That's when all these problems started. The Powells got rid of it, sold it to the Rad Range, September of 2000. In 21 just like that document says how is this possibly grandfathered only being two years old okay if you look on um, the next page let's see here we've got if there is a substantial change in the use of the range after the person acquires title the person may maintain a nuisance action if the action is brought within one year they are now increasing their range making it bigger, moving it to the front yard, just 100 yards off of Fawcett Lane. The very bottom of the second page, this article does not prohibit a local government from regulating the location and construction of a sport shooting range. You guys have the power. You can save us from this nightmare that's going on. Also, page three, 
This is North Carolina Virginia regulations regarding gun ranges. No person shall shoot a firearm in a manner that would cause any rifle or smooth mortar projectile to travel off the range, except gunshot uh, number four smaller, as long as it doesn't risk harm or injury to persons. Okay. No ricochets, no accidental shootings. You can't have any bullets going off the gun range. It could kill somebody. That's what the statute for North Carolina state law says right there in yellow. Page four, North Carolina Supreme Court has shut down a gun range for the very, very same reasons that we are concerned about. It's near two roads and it's near homes. The Supreme Court turned down, got rid of. Pages nine, five through nine are what other counties have done to protect their neighborhoods. Evidence of liability insurance with the county as the beneficiary. If you're going to let some gun range have bullets going off the gun range, crossing roads, and going on other people's property, the county better assume some responsibility for that. That's why these other counties have got liability insurance with them as the beneficiary. Also, gun range permits should not be transferable. There should not be um, any shooting within a quarter mile of an occupied dwelling. Now, these are just random counties with their different ordinances. Half a mile from an occupied building. 300 yards from livestock, 300 yards from any dwelling, uh, shooting stations, burns 26 feet high, and noise. Again, follow our procedure, I'll follow okay. You and, stop. and please look at the last page. I assure you, we will look at every page. It's very important. This just shows you something that I think we all need to be concerned about. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Caps. When I have to stop someone, I, uh, I'm going to apologize, but uh, we're trying to be fair to everyone. All caps, 3259 North Tennessee Highway 62. Lived my address over 30 years. Uh, I just wanted to, the ordinance that you're thinking about passing today, I'd like to ask the commissioners and the sheriff, if he's, if he's able to speak, how is this going to be enforced? Or do we have to find shells and bullets and then call or is someone going to have to be shot or hurt before we get involved or you get involved and the sheriff gets involved to get this worked out because uh, as it is now if it leaves the property unless we go find the bullet somewhere who, who's going to be responsible we got and I'd like for you to ask the sheriff to comment on that if you don't mind okay I'm through thanks Thank you, sir Okay, we're now down to our consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. second. Oh, Mr. Turner said the second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by the saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Now down to item number seven. And I understand you want to do H. Oh, is it I and J? Right, I and J. Again, my glasses are sitting on my desk. <laughs> uh, Steve will help me. I have my uh, guide dog sitting to my right. <laughs> Wolf. <laughs> okay. Good morning, Commissioners. We're on the way in other words. Give me just one second. Good morning. Thank Good morning. Um, we're going to start with the first item, and that is a request to pass a amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance. This one is for a text amendment to Appendix A on plat certificates. These certificates are part of the recording process. This is a specific certificate for the Environmental Health Group. The state has implemented a new, different way for them to approve septic systems, and this actually would comply with what the state has asked for them to do. So we just need to get this in our book for them to be able to use it. This also has, just for your information, the um, cons consistency statement behind it. So any motions would have to include that consistency statement. Yeah. 
open public hearing? We, um, what are you asking us to do at this point? Uh, at this point, we're, that's just your background information, and we'll have to open up for a public hearing, and then we can move forward. All right. Do we have a motion to go into a public hearing? So moved. Second. We have a motion and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. We are now in the public hearing. Do you folks know what we're in a public hearing about? Shake your head if you do. <laughs> Nobody's shaking their head. Okay. Um, this is a UDO amendment, um, Appendix A, flat certificates. Do you need to give any further explanation? Sure do. Can you give any information to the board? Which I'm sorry. I can help with any information to the board. All right. Are there any public comments from this side of the room regarding this matter? Are there any public comments from this side of the room regarding this matter? Is this going to take? Big point out. Is it going to take two readings? No, sir. Just one reading. Motion closed public hearing. Second. Second. Thank you. Okay, we're back in our regular meeting. Board, questions, Mr. Turner? Do we vote? We have not voted yet. We'll close the public hearing. All in favor of closing the public hearing, seeing the public saying aye. 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 Thank you. Mr. Turner, any questions? No. Mr. Carter? Ms. Thompson? Mr. Lashley? No, sir. All right. I have no comments. Do we have a motion as to this matter? Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Yes, can we add that consistency statement to the motion? It's in your packet, be towards the back of your packet. Is that item number seven that you have? It's number four. It's on page 52. Is that correct? Page 89 of your passage. And this is just as a statement that by state law we have to read to say that it agrees with all of it. All right, would you please read them? Well, sure. The Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby finds that the proposed amendment to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance is consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners finds that the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county to promote flexibility in development ordinances and to develop con conscious strategies for proactivity managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. Therefore, the Board of Commissioners finds that the proposed amendment ordinance is necessary to remove ambiguous and conf conflicting language within the existing ordinance. Therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners recommends approval of the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance this first day of May 2023. Would the mover like to amend his motion? Or as to the approval of this matter? Did I move to the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So amended. And the second was, I think we had two or three seconds. I think it was that side. I do. Do you no, amend no, your no. second? I do. All right. Again, all in favor with the amended motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Yes, sir. You're going to J, correct? I am. This is a little bit different than the item you just did. This is an amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance specific to temporary residences. Uh, the county has had several or several questions about using RVs on property outside of what would be an RV park. So as the current language reads in the Unified Development Ordinance, temporary use of a manufactured home or travel trailer as a residence shall be permitted in cases where the permanent home has been destroyed through no fault of the owner or tenant Temporary housing permit must be obtained from the planning staff before the use of the manufactured home or travel trailer is initiated. Such temporary housing permit shall be valid for a specific period of time, not to exceed 12 months, while reconnection takes place, or reconstruction, please. 
and may be renewed no more than once. The unit must be removed within 30 days of receipt of the certificate of occupancy for newly constructed unit. All temporary housing must conform to the standards in Chapter 26, Article 2, Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance, and shall tie into existing water and sewer services for the principal residents on the lot. So that's how our ordinance currently, currently reads. So you can have an RV only if the primary house has been destroyed and no fault of the owner or the tenant. Uh, and looking at this, this was written in 2021 when we did the actual UDO, the full UDO. So what we're looking to do is amend that language today. This is a uh, text amendment that has been through planning board. Uh, county staff, including legal, have reviewed and written language per what the planning board was looking at and what the cases they felt like needed specific attention. <coughs> so we're allowing uh, permits, and there's three situations with the new text amendment that we would allow that. And it says, if used as a supplementary residence in addition to the permanent residential dwelling unit for up to 12 months. No extra explanations, you're just allowed to put a unit on there for 12 months, you get a permit from planning. Second opportunity is if you use as a temporary residence based on a bona fide farm, bona fide emergency, which has made permanent residential units on a parcel unsuitable for habitation for up to 12 months with the option to renew for an additional 12 month period by the planning department. Use a travel trailer or RV as a temporary residence must cease within 30 days a certificate of occupancy of the permanent residential unit. So th this is kind of covering with those tornadoes and stuff that came through our snow camp a couple years ago. This kind of would help those situations out. Uh, the last opportunity we have written is if used as a temporary residence during the course of renovation or construction of a permanent residential dwelling unit on a parcel for up to 12 months with the option to permit renewal an additional six month period by the planning department. Use of the travel trailer or RV as a temporary residence must cease within 30 days of receipt of occupancy of the permanent dwelling. So if you're renovating or building a new home, you can put it on there for a year and then you could be extended as much as six months after that first year to allow for these uses. Part of the end of this says, all temporary residences permitted under this section must conform to standards in Chapter 26, Flood Damage Prevention Ordinance. It shall tie them to properly permitted water, electrical, septic or sewer services on the property. Use of the travel trailer or RV as temporary housing must cease within 30 days of certificate of occupancy from the building department. So once you actually get the ability to live in said unit, you can still have those RVs there, but they're stored, they're not lived in. So that's our proposal for the language change for to allow some temporary uses on property with RVs. But that's your background, so we will have a public hearing on this as well. We can go into public hearing. Public hearing. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. We, we are now in a public hearing. Anyone on this side of the room? Anyone that wants to speak? Anyone on this side of the room? Nobody's on. Uh, Speaker, I assume, or Zoom? No, sir. All right. Okay. Do we have a motion to go out of the public hearing? So, second. Have a motion second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh huh. It's unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Chair, before you take any um, action on the text amendment, I would just ask that the last sentence of the entire highlighted area is duplicative of where that same sentence occurs in sections B and C. Um, that should have been removed before this was added to your agenda. So I would ask that whatever motion is made be made to adopt this potentially, but removing that last sentence in the highlighted area before it's adopted. Uh, can you read the sentence that you want removed? Yes, I will. Use of the travel trailer or RV as temporary housing must cease within 30 days of receipt of certificate of occupancy for the primary house housing unit. And the reason I'm asking to remove that is that it occurs in two other places, so it's redundant. Thank you. <coughs> Substantially, this just increases it from 180 days to 365, is that correct? In well, it gives small. three different opportunities where before you had to just have destruction of the primary residence before you could put anything on there. These allow for some different opportunities while keeping a primary residence there as well. Question, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Cavalier, if I have, <coughs> say I'm uh, my 
families <coughs> uh, over the holidays they come in in December they stay through you know mid January that's outside of 30 days they have an RV or a trailer and they just want to leave it in a driveway or something and stay in that while they're there I don't see that this ordinance speaks to that so that's use of supplementary residence in addition to the permanent residence item number A that would offer up to 12 months but so you know what if you come quarterly yeah, and you stay a week and you're always coming quarterly you're staying weeks. it's not really 12 months I mean I, I, just don't, I don't know that it, I don't know that it speaks to that how would you interpret that so what we had talked about with planning board and legal is you get we're issuing a piece of paper permit that you're putting in the window of whatever this is an RV or a camper and it sits there for a year so for a year you can come and go as you need to please okay. and after that year that ability goes away could you reapply the following year for the same the same light so we didn't write in there that they'll reapply that was a specific discussion yeah so a, a couple of things if I could speak to this um, we, we made it so that the permit wasn't required until the RV had been used for a 30-day period so that was intentional to uh, allow for some transient use without the planning board being involved in inspecting those situations so the example that you gave is if I come quarterly and I stay seven days, then at least to me, it seems like that would never implicate the permitting process because it's not used anything other than every three months for a week at a time, and that's not a consecutive 30-day period. And, but, and you can do it because you don't have to get a permit, or you can't do it because you didn't I get a permit? the way this was intended was to allow for that type of use without permitting. What we wanted to try to button down was a situation where someone intended to use the trailer as a supplementary residence for a long period of time such that you could run into some of the public health and permitting issues that we're trying to curtail. So if they're staying for over that month at Christmas, the 31 days maybe that will trigger. And then you could would be required to get a permit that you could use for a year and if they came the next year and did the same thing you wouldn't be able to do it right that's why if it was for a short amount of time it wouldn't be a big deal well that's, if it was that's 31 cool. days in the next year you're required to get a permit but the statute wouldn't allow you to do that because it was there's no reapplication available under the ordinance not under okay. subsection a that's yeah. correct but i don't see that b or c would apply either also correct um, an RV of this type would have to be connected to the, I guess, the septic tank or the sewer system, right? Right, it's part of the end of the packages that they would have to have that permit for the normal house the first. Right mm -hmm. But, uh, statement before I answer your question um, what we're trying to fix and what became obvious here is in the current temporary use of manufactured home or travel trailer ordinance there is no allowance for use other than in a situation where the primary occupied home on the property has been destroyed there's no allowance for a friend to come stay for a weekend without implicating uh, a violation of the ordinance so this was really an effort to create some leniency uh, in two ways. Number one, to give 30 days before any permit would be required. Right now, there's no allowance for any period of time before a permit is supposed to be applied for and issued. So that's number one. And number two was to give up to 12 months of use with that permitted uh, inspected use in place. So we're allowing people to use it uh, on a temporary basis but we want to have some ability to say that they're actually hooked up to sewer and that type of thing so that was really what we were trying to do um, I will say that it seems like there are probably some use cases that aren't necessarily squarely addressed by this um, I think that's just a, a problem in any drafting but 
at the end of the day, what we were trying to create was a scheme where I could use the property in good faith while allowing our inspections folks some ability to know what's going on. Does that answer your question? Kind of, sort of. Okay. Specifically, uh, I'm concerned about not being able to, to refile and get an extension on the permit period. If so, if, you know, who knows what kind of things can come up, and you you well, wind up being in a situation where okay, now I can't get it extended. I think our citizens ought to be able to if they run into some. Well, circumstance that requires that ought to be able to get an extension. I think what the board, at least before, had had seen fit to curtail was perpetual use, right? Right. And and so we're trying to again curtail that perpetual use. And there are some use cases that were identified: bona fide emergencies, construction of the permanent residence, where a period of time beyond twelve months might be necessary and even allowable. Um, but just supplementary residential use was not seen at least by the planning board to be a situation where we as a county wanted to allow perpetual use of an RV. Um, so we're just trying to at both ends of the scale create some leniency for short-term use but also curtail permanent use of an RV on a property because of the concern for that. But if you allow for a reissuing of a permit then it has to go through the process all over again it could be denied if it appeared that somebody was just trying to take advantage of the reissue building, denied. Correct. But if there was an extenuating circumstance where they needed another six months or three months or a month, then right. you could, that would give the planning department or the planning board the option of approving. Correct. We do have that in items B and C. Those are for construction purposes and extraordinary events, just not in A. We have that in B and C where people are in right. construction or extraordinary. It's just A of, I have my house here and I want my friend to come stay for some length of time. A year seemed to be applicable. Did it? In a year, they either could find a spot in an RV park or have some other more permanent residence arranged. An apartment, a rental home, or something like that. But if there's a bona fide emergency or a renovation, those are both seen as times and instances where greater allowance could and should be made. And so it's drafted to allow for that in those instances. So greater than 12 months is possible. If there is an emergency or if there's construction okay, well, that's, that's that was delayed. Question in the first place. Yes. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Mr. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I guess the uh, one, one question I have is uh, I do like your language in this, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory to most folks. Um, I do have a question, though. Uh, do we charge these people, let's say, like in snow camps, tornado comes, blows your house down, you get an RV, and you put it on your property as you're building your new house. Does the county charge those people for that permit? So that's going to depend on which permit you're talking about. Environmental health is going to do what they consider a check on the system and things. And in building inspections, when you have something come in, they'll need an electrical hookup and recertify those things. We do weigh those fees for storm damage. So the uh, person who's impacted will, I mean, they already have a whole lot on their plate in the sense you get your house blown up. But that's good that the county doesn't charge them for that. But uh, does the environmental health, do they charge for the services when they come out to inspect? Septic and uh, and well situation at that. To, 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 to my knowledge, they do. Okay. Um, do you know how much that is? Well, I know that's not. I'll be Tony kidding. is in the other room. He might be coming quickly. Uh, we'll see. But the, I do not know what their fees. I'm just curious. That's all. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. Out there, so. It's not a big deal. I, just, I was just curious what what the cost was. Uh, and I like the fact that you have it in here because if we see what's going on in some of the larger cities out west, like San Francisco. Um, LA, Oakland, in which you have people who come and bring these RVs and park them on the side of the road and they're there forever and there's nobody to move it. Does this take care of that? I think you use the word perpetual as this would, this would not, you could not leave a, uh, a trailer in a particular spot for unlimited amount of time. You can store it, you just can't live in it. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. And that's why we put this under temporary residence for that purpose. We don't see these as something for permanent living. Building code doesn't as well, so we put it under the title we thought fit this. Okay, great. Thank you. 
I just want to make sure that this is just totally different. Um, old Winnebago's that are um, flat tires and everything, camper shells, and all kind of places like that that are in yards with grass of about four feet. This that's not it, right? We've got language for that in our junk car ordinance. Depending on how many they have, things like that. We don't address grass, but those other vehicles fall or something totally different because these are just ones we're living in. Okay. We expect them to be able to be moved when they need to be moved. No flat how, tires, all really. Well, how long is, is that supposed to take? It's just it's just a nightmare for a lot of folks who live beside situations like this. And we are really intense on this, but I just wonder if we're going to ever be intense on reporting situations. You know, we have situations. There's so much stuff to deal with. Yeah, and we're in court on a few cases trying to get some help yeah. from um, higher than us to get some of these situations taken care of. So I'm easily comply. So. Well, it's kind of sad when the county has to pay to clean up other people's mess. Amen. It's been their their issue, and that can get out of control. Mm -hmm. It's like an addiction. You just, you just get stuck. And then you, sometimes you find out what's in the house, and then DSS gets involved and all kind of other stuff. So I was just curious. I just hope we can relay that to where we can really get serious about that. Because if I live beside that and I ever wanted to sell my home, it would probably be a real bad situation. Could be. Yeah. Depreciation. I don't have any comments. Lord, do we have a motion? Who's da 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 John, is that your phone? Are you got an alarm going? I think it's, it's good. <laughs> okay, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> We're all wondering whose it is. Because my preacher would take your phone if that was going on. <laughs> yeah, Larry would do that. He would take it. <laughs> It's my meter telling me my ankle is killing me. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm sorry. Which is bandaged up. Uh, okay, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. So with the consistency statement? <coughs> with the consistency statement? Yes. yes. And also and the removing the last sentence. Yeah, we're moving that one. <laughs> and removing yeah. the final sentence. And the one that I read earlier. Okay, that's great. And would you read the statement for us, please? The statement? Sure. <laughs> All right, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby finds that the proposed amendment to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance is consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners finds the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county to promote flexibility in development ordinances and to develop conscious strategies for proactively managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. Furthermore, the Board of Commissioners finds that the proposed amendments amendment are ne is necessary to remove ambiguous and conflicting language within the existing ordinance. Therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners recommends approval of the proposed amendment to the Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance this first day of May 2023. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? No. No. <coughs> I uh, see there's three yes and two no, correct? I said yes. I think Craig's the only no. One no. Craig's the only no. 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 I think it's four one. No, I Craig's said no. no. Oh, okay. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. You said no. Okay. So it's three two, but it passes. Thank you. Okay, Surrey County. Are you going to need a minute to set up a uh, film and so forth? No, we have the PowerPoint presentation ready. All right. Thank you. And welcome. Thank you, sir. How's your PowerPoint? Or do I just okay. point? Bruce, do you have a quick up ahead? <clears throat> hey, would you tell us? We know who you are, but people out in, in television land do not know. My name is Mark Willis, and I work as Surrey County's Director of Substance Abuse Recovery. Good morning. Good morning. General woman and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the privilege of being able to speak to you. And you've got uh, an immense agenda there. I will try to be brief. I've modified uh, my normal presentation to... Uh, to add some stuff, and I'll skip over some stuff that I think that uh, that are most 
pertinent to what commissioners would want to know. Um, Let me ask you, is your county uh, manager here? He is not. Uh, he sends his regrets. Uh, his father is ill and he spent the evening, uh, actually the whole night in the hospital and, and uh, asked that uh, I send uh, his regards and his regrets. We appreciate his willingness and our prayers are with his I'll pass that on. Family. I've had the, uh, the pleasure to meet with uh, Commissioner Thompson and uh, Commissioner Carter uh, a little while ago. Uh, I have an idea of what uh, Alamance County is facing as well as, as uh, what it would like to do. So again, I'm going to tailor some of uh, what I normally present um, to your liking, hopefully. Um, I think for commissioners, it's important to, uh, to note that what your county needs and what your county wants and what your agencies that might support this effort are willing to do may be uh, not parallel. Um, and if there's any uh, benefit or genius into what our commissioners decided to do in 2018, it's that I think they grasped that and when uh, they hired me, which I think took about six or seven months of, of interviews before they found somebody foolish enough to take the job, uh, I asked them really within the first day, what do you expect from me? Because they had a job description uh, that was written by the health department, the, the, uh, the director there, that um, was a little um, lacking in its descriptions, largely because they couldn't find a position in the state uh, to, uh, uh, to replicate. And I think uh, they were very succinct in what they said. And I commend them for this. And number one, they said we have a significant problem that affects uh, the number one problem that they face, and you know what that is, that's your budget. There's a number of items on your agenda tonight that deal with budget. Um, and I'll talk about uh, that uh, briefly when we were able to put some dollar uh, figures to that. Uh, we don't understand the problem. Please explain it to us. Uh, in a sense, conduct an investigation. Number two, we don't know how we got here. Uh, most of my commissioners uh, grew up in that county and they were trying to figure out how, uh, how their county uh, separated itself from the reputation of, of Mayberry. And lastly, uh, they said, once you figured out those first two things, please come back to us and with a, a list of solutions and we'll evaluate how this is done. Now, I report directly to the county manager as a director. Um, that's very helpful uh, and I'm very healthy uh, because I get my knock on his door and he almost always uh, takes uh, my comments or uh, or recommendations and we evaluate them. His direction initially was not to make this uh, this program, however it develops, into uh, a grant driven program. <coughs> Very experienced in grants he is and uh, he did not want <coughs> this to be a rollover every three years to different priorities. And that's what they gave them. Um, so with that, um, <coughs> They let me go, and I spent probably the first nine months uh, doing nothing but interviews, and I interviewed everybody I could think of, inside and outside the county that might have impact, influence, or information that would help me understand the problem. And I think uh, in my normal course, I took uh, notes, I came back, uh, typed them up, highlighted them, and then I went to another interview, and I think I counted some 220 some interviews over the period of eight months. My last question was always, who do you think I should talk to next? And I would go to, to that person. That gave me a good feel of what the county was willing to do. Uh, and I didn't talk to just uh, judges or the sheriff, or I talked to community influencers, teachers, <coughs> superintendents, as well as the, the, the commissioners. The first thing uh, I, would, I asked for was a, a part-time uh, community outreach coordinator, somebody to do prevention. 
because we were significantly lacking in any effort to do prevention. It was, it was the sheriff's office uh, uh, providing uh, the DARE program, it was the Health Nutrition Center providing someone that went into the schools with a candy box and uh, they, they weren't coordinated. So I didn't ask to coordinate, all I just asked was to have a representative that would start some kind of prevention program in the county. <clears throat> the next thing uh, I did was start asking what does the community know? And I did a series over about nine months of eight forums uh, that were attended anywhere from 300 to to 50 people, specifically focusing on the, the uh, faith-based community to attend. What I, uh, what I realized in the first eight uh, were that there was a lot of, we don't know what's going on. So there was a lot of information supplied to the group. And uh, the last meeting filled up uh, an entire theater of over 300 people. And what I got from that in February of 2021 was, what are we doing about it? And unfortunately, we got hit with a ball bat uh, come February of 2021, and everything was shut down, and no more forums occurred for almost a year. But internally, uh, what taking some of the numbers and statistics that we're able to accumulate, uh, accumulate is uh, we we found that emergency rooms and EMS had uh, responded to over 700 overdoses. In, in our county of 72,000 people. Uh, go back a step, uh, ignominious start from my position was in uh, June of 2018, Surrey County uh, was number one in the state for opioid related overdoses uh, per capita that were reported by emergency rooms. So I started, uh, unfortunately, on the bottom, and the only positive part I had was there's nowhere to go from here but up. Uh, so taking those conversations with EMS, which has been exceptionally supportive, and the emergency rooms, which were also supportive, uh, the next question was, well, that's wonderful. Over 700 overdoses, what are we doing about it? And the answer was, we treat and we release. So I went back to the county and said, you didn't want a grant-driven program, and I recognize we had over 700 opportunities to do something to connect people to treatment, said, how about helping me uh, establish what in this state is more normally called a post-overdose response team. We call it an intervention team because we take referrals from every source, and I'll cover that just, just briefly. Uh, I have brought my coordinator with me, a peer support specialist. Uh, she runs our, our uh, intervention team if you have any specific questions about um, our intervention team. Um, we found that after creating an intervention team and then taking people to treatment providers, of which we had very few in the county, um, the treatment provider said, hey, that's great. You're bringing, bringing potential clients to us, but about 25% of the people you bring to us can't get here. Um, so I made an effort to try to uh, enlist the faith community in helping me with a, a, a transportation program. I failed miserably at that, not the faith community's problem. It was mine. Uh, I figured out later I shouldn't be asking the faith community to involve themselves in treatment programs or uh, interventions. I should be asking them to support a recovery network. Uh, and that's what we're doing now. But that caused me to try to look for funding for transportation. And presently, uh, we run five vehicles and five drivers that do nothing but take people to court, to treatment, to task, to probation, because if you don't go to those things, you don't stay inside your, your treatment program. And I'll show you some of the stats on that later. Um, I also, at the same time, the grant that provided funding for that transportation asked for funding through the grant for a data analyst because what I found was the data that was necessary to be able to analyze what was going on inside our county wasn't granular enough to give us information that the sheriff could digest, the EMS the director could digest, the health department could digest, or for that matter, that the, the commissioners could understand. And so now I have a data analyst on board that does nothing but research and collect data 
at our level because what came from uh, the health nutrition or uh, DHHS at the state level, CDC uh, or otherwise uh, NIDA, SAMHSA just didn't provide us enough vision at our level to be able to understand what's going on. Um, and a point to that, since the sheriff is here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say one of the things that why granular data at the level that you can see is important is because we have multiple organizations that measuring success trying to address a substance issue that are actually conflict of interest uh, to each other. The sheriff, uh, law enforcement, which I'm very familiar with, measures success by the number of arrests they make and by the number of people they incarcerate. And that's good because their job is to address the supply reduction problem of this substance use issue. My job is to address the demand reduction part. But guess how EMS uh, reports its success, right? The number of overdoses that, that they respond to, the number of Narcan uh, administered uh, and opioid reversals. So if the sheriff's job is to lock people up and EMS's job is to is to try to save those people, sometimes they're the same people. And if they don't uh, see that, that, that their, their measures of success are in conflict with each other, and if you, that's the kind of data we don't get from DHHS, you end up at cross purposes. Uh, I now have a full-time uh, outreach, uh, community outreach coordinator, and I'll show you some of the things that, that she does. And I think something that, um, uh, you should consider well, however you implement our program here is that part about a community needs assessment. And we spent uh, six months uh, doing a community needs assessment which was online, which received about uh, just over 700 responses and we did 50 in-depth uh, interviews an hour to an hour and a half of community influencers. We took that, spent a couple of months putting it all together and I'll show you where, uh, in the end, where that uh, community needs assessment really comes in handy when it comes to your how you're going to implement your uh, your monies from opioid litigation settlement funds. <coughs> what are we doing about it? Uh, we'll go into some of that granular data uh, at, at the end, but uh, these were the responses. These are the things we're doing. To, uh, to try to move the needle in a positive direction for substance use in Surrey County. There's my uh, community outreach coordinator that does nothing but um, prevention presentations. Uh, right now, she focuses her efforts on those things on the upper left-hand corner. Why? Because that's what the community needs assessment said. That's what our population said they wanted. We focus on, on stopping overdoses, uh, youth empowerment, uh, education to youth specifically when it comes to, to vaping, and suicide prevention, because that's what our community said that they wanted. Our intervention team is actually staffed for three. I have two peer support specialists on hand, and uh, you can see that that intervention team is uh, received in just about uh, short of two and a half years over 924 referrals. Um, we get about 45 to 50 referrals a month now and we get those from uh, from EMS, uh, Sheriff's Office, uh, pre-trial uh, and the numbers you can see in the lower right hand corner. And we, out of those numbers, I know commissioners are interested in this because mine uh, uh, are uh, about that 924 as of the end of March, we placed a little over 200 uh, and connected them to, to treatment. Um, uh, that would be either uh, a residential program or an outpatient program. Uh, others that have not or did not want to go to treatment were connected to social services, whatever they needed. Um, even if it's a, a survivor bag, with uh, toothpaste and toothbrushes or if it's connection to other programs that, uh, that they ask for. That's my transportation program. Uh, we 
uh, in a, just short of two years with, like I said, uh, five vehicles and uh, five drivers uh, have uh, received just about 2,000 requests for transportation and uh, served uh, about 800 people. Uh, and again, those either uh, atypical uh, outpatient program it is called uh, substance abuse intensive outpatient. That's a three day a week, three hour a day uh, treatment program. And if you don't have transportation, very difficult to get to it. So we pick them up at home, we take them to the treatment program, we take them home uh, after the end of the three hour treatment program. You find that if you don't have transportation, and you have a history of substance use and you're in treatment, you probably have an extensive uh, criminal history or at least a criminal history that requires you to clean up uh, your, your, uh, your court docket, which means you need to get to court. <coughs> and you typically you're on probation, you need to see probation. And then you gotta get to a job if you can get a job. Um, and those are the things that we provide transportation to as well as tasks, and then you find out if you're sick, you can't get to the doctor, you're not gonna to get to court, and you're not gonna get the treatment, and you're not gonna get the task. So we transport to doctors <coughs> as well. Something we just started a couple of months ago, uh, we called the Vital Links Business Center, and I have one peer support specialist, that's uh, Ms. Calloway on the left, and a business advisor who I stole from the Economic Development Partnership, and he wasn't too happy about that, but she knew every, every one of the 1,800 businesses we have in the county. And now what we do is uh, communicate either with people in the detention center through a paytel pad, uh, do a skills assessment, and know before somebody gets out of the detention center uh, what skills they have and what needs they have for social services, as well as we, we communicate with probation uh, and take referrals from them because it's not probation's job to find someone a job just to make sure they have one. So we facilitate that. And uh, we recruited just over 33 companies now that uh, are participating in our program. And you can see in a couple of months, we've uh, placed 30 people into, uh, into jobs. Now that's what we're doing. And I'm not gonna go deep into to what our commissioners are interested in, but here's something that I think uh, is of significance uh, to you when you're evaluating how you spend your your litigation funds. One of the requirements of the MOA is impact, measuring impact. All those numbers I just threw up there are process numbers. We just keep track of the people we drive and the interventions we do and the people we place in treatment. Those are process numbers and they don't really show any measure of success. We're all gonna be required according to the MOA to be able to uh, measure how you're impacting the, your, the, the problem, whatever it is in your county. Uh, what we've done, uh, and I'm not sure whether this is gonna work or not, but what we've done is under five different categories, personal health, communi uh, community health, family health, business health, and criminal justice, 12 different uh, statistics that we can measure, some, some things we wanna be able to keep track of, we can't measure and then compare ourselves to 12 other counties uh, that, and we're tier one, 12 other counties that are demographically similar. Um, to compare ourselves to 99 other counties uh, where we're not demographically similar, it is, uh, it's not a proper measurement. So we're gonna look at uh, hepatitis, uh, suicides, uh, children in foster care that were taken away from their parents due to substance use, um, NAS uh, issues, that comes from our uh, Child Protective Services and Health Nutrition Center because that's the number we can keep track of, the number of mothers who are pregnant who are on a, on a treatment plan because we have no NIC uh, unit in our two hospitals. Most of our, almost all of our births for uh, NAS potential uh, babies are born at, out of county. We keep track of uh, our unemployment rate and our labor force participation rate. That's pretty important to businesses. Those two measurements are antithetical to each other. They say different things. And uh, we keep track of our overdose deaths, although I think that 
is a red herring as well as keeping track of, of overdoses. Um, and we're looking at uh, overdose emergency room visits because we just need to keep track of that. Our incarceration rate, which we can get from the sheriff, and some things that uh, police departments don't normally share, but our sheriff is sharing with us, is our uh, involuntary commitment numbers and our crimes against property. Why? Because about 90% of those are by substance users who, are, who commit crimes in order to fuel their habit. Um, so we don't know, I'm not going into the details of those, but just that we have to figure out how to measure all the process, or all the process things we're doing actually impacting our, our community. And we're gonna have to do that, and we're gonna have to post it online, and we're gonna have to, at the end of every year, show how much money we spent from those litigation funds as well as prove that we move the needle in some direction. Those are some of the things that we're working on. <coughs> Keep in mind that um, our mission and, and our office is to build a continuum of care uh, for substance users, uh, for those who suffer from substance use disorder and reside in our, in our county who are seeking, that verb is very important, who are seeking treatment and recovery. We don't try to replicate anything that exists, and in fact, I tell my people that what we do is pretty much what everyone else is willing to do, and we fill the holes in that continuum of care. If that term sounds a little wonky, uh, you've just been living through a continuum of care for the past three years, prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery, and that was what COVID was all about. Now, that thing that all my staff calls is a QR code, and I'm gonna close <laughs> on, on, on this. It does look like a QR code. And I stuffed it all on one screen, not because you need to read any of the words on there, but the concept is this. Once we got done with the needs assessment, uh, that community needs assessment, and uh, quantified all of it, that list on the left uh, was 42 different things that our community said they thought we needed to do. Uh, and now I had no way of prioritizing that. I had no way of figuring out what should we do first. Um, so we, we read that MOA that came from the Department of Justice. You know there's an option A and there's an option B. We took that and put every, look at the top of that QR code what we call our prioritization planning model. And the top of that, the white, the white diagonals are the strategies in option A, and the gray diagonals are the strategies in option B. So all we did was cross them. And if what the community said it wanted corresponded to what could be done as a strategy in the MOA, it got a green block. <coughs> if the strategy uh, didn't uh, correspond to what the community said it wanted, it got a black block. And all I did was add up the green blocks and the, one, and the strategy that, or the desire on the part of our community is what it said it needed. Uh, if, it, if it corresponded to the strategy, you see uh, you got 23 on the far right, you can't read it, but you can see all the green blocks. So building a recovery-oriented system of care in our community is what our, our uh, community said it wanted. That got strategy, that got priority one. And it went down to the bottom where a lot of black blocks, that's a low priority. So what it did to the benefit of our commissioners, and this is what I said to our commissioners when I presented this to them, was that, um, and that, forgive me for my uh, crassness, but. Uh, I called it my alligators on the on the shoreline theory that once everyone figures out that there's literally millions of dollars available for uh, for programs, they're going to come to you, and you know they are, and they're going to call you at night, and they're going to hit you in the morning, and they're going to say you got, and I don't know what Alamance County's getting, but Surrey County's getting something about sixteen and a half million over eighteen years. That includes the latest settlement from the the pharmacies, uh, they'll say, ah, we should get some of that because my program is viable. It's not my money, it's your money. 
it's the commissioner's money and you decide what you want to do with it. But I said to them, this will allow you to be able to say, my community said it wanted, and this is where we're going to spend our money. Um, so it at least uh, gives you the ability to be able to, to tell and the alligators uh, once they slip into the water and see all that, that blood in the water that um, this, is, this is what my community wanted. Uh, whether you want to comply with that would be entirely up to you. Um, specific questions. Ms. Thompson. No, I've been trying to get them here for nine months. I think you guys need to ask some questions. <clears throat> we asked a lot of questions about RVs. I think this is life and death. We need to ask a lot of questions. Mr. Rice. How much does it cost to get this program started for Surrey County? How many how many full time employees do you have? How many part time? At this point, four and a four and a half years uh, into the program, you saw. Uh, they started me in June of 2018. I can tell you that now a, class, uh, a staff of 13, which is uh, 11 full-time employees and two part-time. Um, if, and I'll give you the full figure and then the breakdown after that for grants, uh, because I operate, I operate on county funds. I operate on money from our uh, managed care organization, which here is by mm -hmm. uh, ours as partners. Uh, they provide me some funding and then a federal grant and a state grant to provide for straight up to provide for those 13 employees it's about seven hundred and thirty thousand dollars that includes uh, salaries and benefits uh, health care policies retirement uh, to operate is that uh, per year yes sir uh, to to operate that's put gas in the cars and i i lease uh five vehicles and have two county vehicles uh, and everything else that we do to include uh, medication for a we just started with uh, EMS uh, about three months ago we do a map bridge program peer support specialist partner with the paramedics and do a a, uh, uh, a map bridge that takes a box on to the street so I pay for those medications as well uh, and that and some of that money comes from the, the uh, managed care organization. It's about $190,000 to keep pens, pencils, uh, phones, gas, uh, and everything else operating. So I'm, I'm just a little over $900,000 to keep everything going. And how much does your county? To, uh, I know there's a lot of federal and state grants for these programs. How much does the county? It breaks down. This was, a, this was a new program that you folks started in 2018. Yes. I'm just trying to figure out how much did it cost your county to get this started. Um, well, my salary was the initial part. How much? Uh, how much do you make, sir? Uh, it's about seventy-three thousand. Thank you. Uh, my county started with my salary, a computer, and a car, and that, uh, and some travel expenses. I even turned the car down, and uh, they, they said you, you needed that. Um, so, um, and then it, over that four and a half year period, it expanded. I get, uh, I've got a $600,000 grant from uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance that's about, so roughly about $200,000 a year. That's my transportation program, uh, which will have to be paid for next year because I'm on my, on my third year. Um, through settlement funds and a, uh, a community linkage to the care grant, which is from DHHS, which funds part of my intervention team, and that's about eighty-five thousand a year, and that ends this year too. My uh, MCO provides about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars a year, and I use that to supplement salaries for somebody on my transportation program. The county has provided, a, on average, about two hundred thousand a year. Um, for operating expenses and my salary. I'll add this because I said I, I would uh, to justify the expense on the intervention team. In 2019, I did a, a, a quick study and I looked at what the Sheriff's Office, what uh, DSS and EMS spent in our county to react to substance use. And the agreement was any any uh, call the sheriff's office went on that involved substance use, 
and anybody incarcerated that involves substance use, that would be a cost. <coughs> same goes for EMS and same goes for DSS. And I got just under four million dollars. And that was that was reactive. We didn't connect anybody to treatment. We didn't uh, refer anybody. So I went back to the commissioners and said, if you give me a little bit of money for an intervention team, I'll start doing proactive work um, and balance that with your reactive work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Turner. How do you connect with your county's health department? Uh, as a director, I, I connect uh, directly with the health director. Are you saying program-wise? Yes. Um, we coordinate with, uh, they have a uh, substance, uh, substance abuse uh, prevention person, uh, so we coordinate. My community outreach coordinator coordinates with that person, and they do trainings together, both in the schools uh, to Hispanic outreach, that's one way. Uh, an extension of our MAP Bridge program uh, is that uh, my peer support specialist will uh, take someone who's in the EMS MAP Bridge program, which is limited to seven days, and they will uh, transition them to a longer term uh, MAP Bridge program that is run by the Health Nutrition Center. Um, but so they have a, a PA there that will write a, a prescription for seven to 14 days for additional Suboxone. The, the idea there is the peers will continue to, to, it will build a bridge for the peers to have time to get someone into a residential or uh, outpatient treatment program. That's another way. Uh, I also assist with transportation for anyone who needs, who doesn't have transportation who needs to get to the health nutrition nutrition center for uh, services that they provide. Um, so anything they ask for, we pretty much assist with. Uh, to counter that, uh, they uh, partnered with me to write that community linkages to care grant that from the state DHHS that provided, has now been a five-year program and provided probably close to $400,000 for intervention programs. Um, you mentioned that you fill the gaps for treatment, and, uh, referrals, interventions that other agencies and other groups don't do. I'm not totally clear about your scope. I mean, I, I know you said you do transportation, you do referrals, but generally, what uh, what other activities do you engage in to fill those gaps? Uh, I don't. I don't know that there's a general there. Uh, I mean, if I my primary focus with uh, prevention is to coalesce a, a prevention message that isn't being done. So uh, we're doing a mass media campaign right, right now on uh, billboards, radio, uh, our, our in-house uh, TV station uh, to in addition to uh, in, in, the, in the schools, uh, talking to the coaches. Uh, those are things that no one else is doing. When it comes to intervention, there is no other program inside the county that identifies people who, or at least takes referrals from any source and tries to connect them to the treatment programs that are available both inside and outside the county. There is no other uh, program that is willing to go to someone's house and pick them up and take them to treatment or take them to court if they can't. If they lack private and uh, or connection to private or public uh, transportation. We don't do uh, treatment per se, but the peer support specialists are connected to treatment programs. Uh, we get now almost uh, half of our referrals come from the two hospitals, either from the EDs or from internal medicine for uh, patients who identified a substance use problem. And since they're not built, or connected to treatment programs, those peers will uh, take people to detox. Uh, we have no detox centers, so we'll drive them outside the county and, and deliver them and pick them up and bring them back and connect them to a treatment program. And uh, for recovery services, we're uh, partnered with uh, sober living, trying to build sober living facilities within the county as well as uh, partnered with uh, one of the the health foundations 
with one of the hospitals to be able to build a, um, a community recovery center, which doesn't exist. Uh, so it's pretty much identifying the needs that aren't served by any other uh, entity within the county and building them and make them operational. Does that does that answer your question? Thank you. Mr. Coleman. Um, by your measurements, how, how, how much have you moved the needs on these issues? You've almost made? none at all. Uh, pardon? Almost none at all. If, if we're looking at those uh, uh, those overdose numbers, uh, if, if that, and I don't like looking at overdose numbers because I think they're a, a red herring, with the advent, and I would, I would imagine uh, the sheriff would say he's had sig uh, significant problems as well during COVID. You look at, uh, that you look at statistics now, there are pre-COVID numbers, and there are COVID numbers, and there are post-COVID uh, numbers. And the isolation, and almost any treatment organization will say this, the isolation mandated by COVID only made uh, the addiction issue worse mm -hmm. uh, because isolation is actually the opposite of what's required for recovery. We did not stop. Uh, we, we transported, uh, we, we did intervention during that time, but I think uh, COVID, I think with the advent of fentanyl, uh, which came in close to the, uh, or around the time of uh, COVID, as well as uh, now xylazine, and, uh, and, and the, uh, the tendency for all these things to be mixed into the same, into drugs that aren't, that typically were clean, uh, we've got a bigger problem than we had three or four years ago. So if on the, and we only started looking at those statistics for impact within the last year. But if we're just looking at overdoses and overdose deaths, we're close to meeting uh, all-time highs. Well, I was just in a meeting this weekend, and one of the things that was covered in it was a discussion about youth and uh, young people involved in either planning suicide, attempting suicide, and not making not not being successful or actual suicides and the numbers among young people are just through the roof. Yes, sir. Uh, there's one thing that I resisted doing and now uh, think that we have to, and, and that is I tried to separate the issue of behavioral health, mental health, from substance use. Right. And now I see it as almost like a, a, a DNA helix. Uh, you can't separate one from another. Uh, is, is there, uh, yeah, I think they're, they're intrinsically uh, related, uh, that uh, can, you almost, even the treatment providers say you can't separate whether someone has a substance use issue because of a mental health issue or, or vice versa. So I think behavioral health is something we're, we're addressing, uh, not specifically if someone is diagnosed with a mental health issue with no substance use, but we can't separate one one from the, the other. My next question is for our uh, finance director. Uh, have we got a number yet on our second tranche of uh, uh, opioid settlement funds and how much we might be getting on an annual basis on that? I don't have that documentation with me right now, Commissioner Carter, but I can get that for the board. I know we have received a second payment, um, but what those future payments will be, I don't have that information with me right now. Okay. That has been disseminated, I think, from the, the pharmacy suit. Uh, they, they've named what hasn't, I think they've named the total amount over a 15 year right. period. They just haven't said when it will start and how much per year right. and well it would be. Uh, well, they've said by county how much you're supposed to get, but that's just the 15-year period. They haven't said how much is front-loaded or uh, how much will be provided each year over that 15-year period. What is the population of Surrey County? 72,000. All right. Uh, sure. About a third of our population. 
Yes, sir. You're at 180,000. 540 square miles. Demographically, uh, or at least geographically, we're very similar. We've got feeders, uh, 74 splits the county, 52 uh, in the upper half uh, connects Mount Airy directly with uh, Winston-Salem. So it's very easy to move uh, the, that supply problem. Um, that, is uh, is a lot like yours with 40. What involvement, if any, do you have with the core system? Uh, I would like to have more, but uh, right now the court system isn't interested in a recovery court, uh, nor are they interested in uh, medication-assisted treatment in the detention center. So I have involvement. I speak to them. I meet with them. Um, but on uh, programs we have yet to uh, implement uh, anything on, on lists that involves the criminal justice system, specifically the court system. Sitting just off your left shoulder uh, is uh, our VIA representative for this region. Uh, and she, in fact, has the next presentation after you, uh, your presentation. And we're going to take about a 10 minute break between those two. I would request, because we have a diversion center here, VIA picks up a lot of what you're addressing right now, and they're doing a really positive and, and good job. I don't know whether that's us or them. <laughs> uh, but I would request that you two talk during our break, uh, because I saw uh, Carolyn taking extensive notes during your presentation. Uh, and she probably can give you some ideas of what we're doing here at Alabama County uh, as opposed to what you guys are doing. And it's a very, I say the two programs are very, very close. Uh, we are opening our new diversion center sometime in the fall or winter of this year, which will have up to 16 beds. Cannot go over that, obviously, because it becomes a hospital. Um, and so we are attempting, with the Sheriff's Department's help, uh, and Sheriff Johnson has been very active in that, uh, with uh, you folks, with VIA, and so forth, so that when arrest, particularly with drug, alcohol, uh, mental health issues, and so forth, are involved, then at that point, instead of automatically taking the individual to jail only, or the hospital only, we have, we'll have the diversion center, which we already have, but will be much larger and much more comprehensive at that point. Um, so I, I think you guys can share ideas. Anyone else on the, this uh, board? I'd just like to say something. Um, you know, if you smoke and you buy, say, a pack of Marlboro Lights, on the side of that pack of cigarettes is a warning that says, this is really dangerous for you. You know, it could possibly kill you, but go ahead and buy it because you're making me money. Thank you, have a nice day. And on beer, which has been a big conversation here lately, um, same thing, I recommend you to somebody if um, you start to have a drinking problem after you've already bought it. It's the same with gambling. It's the same with any kind of addiction. And um, as long as it can make that person money, they're gonna let you be the victim of it. And, um, and I don't really know, we honestly really are willing to look at how much this cost us, not just in dollar figures, but in the lives of people. Um, I was at a house two weeks ago with a family I've known since I was 21 years old, and their 23-year-old son was found dead in a motel room in Wilmington while at treatment. And he's gone, and this is a great family. It's not what we always want to try and make people think that they're drugs, they're addicts, you know. It's all of us. It, I tell you, addiction, just like domestic violence and sexual assault, does not pick out your checkbook. It just finds a hole in you to just suck the life out of you. So um, as great as the Diversion Center is and as great as body is, because I've had to call them a couple of times myself, Donald Roos, you walk on water, help me with some things. But we need more than that because this is on the ground in the boots. You know, it's one thing to be in a big aircraft carrier in the ocean and send out some missiles. But it's another thing to be the Army and the Marine that goes into the city and looks in each room trying to find somebody that's out to kill you. So I just hope that we are 
really open-minded to this and see it improve because I think everybody that harms themselves and this gets hold of them and it's it's your own personal demon because when you're adding xylosine that Narcan won't touch and you're putting fentanyl in that they use to you know, sedate elephants, that tells you how desperate you are and how your life probably doesn't matter. And sometimes the only person that your life matters to are people like me and people like Mark and Sonia that are in the face of it because you do matter. I think everybody's savable. I don't care who you are and what you've done. That's why my Christ works. But um, I think we need to not get so stuck in one thing. We need to just have the whole umbrella and um, to make sure our citizens are safe because it is taking out people of all ages. It's going on the youth. It's going to suck it to them. Um, suicide rates, you know, doubled during COVID. I said that when I was on the Board of Education. I was called a COVID denier. And because um, when you get isolated, trust me, an addict don't care about a mask. They care about finding that next high. And, um, and we just really have to take this beyond serious because jail doesn't fix you. It's like holding your breath. And they got to be real pros about suitcase. I know what that means now. Uh, bringing stuff in. I'll never get over that. But um, we have we got to kind of get our heads out of the sand and realize that it, it takes everything to defeat this. And sometimes you don't win. Sometimes you die. And, and that's what we got to do our best because the kid on heroin, could, and he's saved to be the next kid to invent the cure for cancer. And I think they all deserve that. Um, it's a lot to have to be a young person nowadays. Everything's going against you. And uh, this is one thing that doesn't need to. So uh, I'm just, I'm so thankful you're here because your brilliance precedes you. When I saw you at the training and wherever I was in Concord, or Cabarrus County, wherever, and I knew you were the right people to come up here and tell us because there's always things that has to walk through the fire and make every mistake to get everything right. And those are the people that you learn from. You don't need a consultant. You don't need to hire somebody to tell you how to do it when you've had somebody to walk through the fire that's done it and it's proven. And uh, the biggest thing you need to do is have empathy and realize that um, we all mess up and we all should care about that. Um, but that's, that's all. Thank you, Mark. And we thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Sorry for taking more. Uh, thank you. I yeah, We're going to take a 10 minute break, and you folks get together, please. Yeah. Yeah. We're back in session. Lord, we have uh, the gun ordinance item. Uh, the sheriff has asked that we bump that up to the next item because he has a news conference and meetings prior to that news conference. Uh, I can't do that on my own. Are you willing to do that? I'd like a motion that we change the item. Move it up for the sheriff. Seven each. I'll second that motion. Uh, this is item 7H that we're going to move up if we get the vote to do so. We have a motion second. All in favor, second by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Mr. I guess this is Stevens. Uh, thank you, Chair Payson. So, um, as the board might remember, we spoke about this item two weeks ago, and this is the second uh, consideration of the ordinance based on the law that changed in 2019 requiring that we vote on any ordinance with a criminal penalty twice. Uh, I would once again ask the board reconsider uh, the ordinance that we adopted and voted on two weeks ago. I think the best way to go ahead and start this is to see if there are any questions or concerns that I can address before we reread the ordinance and have a vote. Well, Mr. Turner, I'm going to call on you first. Uh, oh, okay. You discussed some issues. I, I don't have a, I don't have any questions about the substance of the statute, but, but I do have a comment about the penalties. And if we, could we? Well, can we go down the Section, the last section. Section eight. Should be the last slide. There you go. Uh, I've heard some, some comments from some folks which I tend to agree with it, and that five hundred dollars seems uh, like a big penalty for a first violation. And I wonder if we might consider some graduation of of fines based upon first offense, second offense. Uh, if we did that, would that would that delay our process? If we consider the change. Would that 
to anything with that delay of process? Good question. So because the change in law from a few years ago is relatively new, requiring two readings, I think the safest interpretation at this point is to say that if we change anything today from the way that it was read and adopted by the board last time, we would have to then read it again with the changes. So if we make changes today, this would be the first vote, uh, and then we'd move forward. Or if we didn't make changes today and you asked me to make substantive changes, I could represent to the board, and then there'd be two votes required on the new proposed amendment. Yeah, I think there's some benefit to, to considering what, what John Paul Jones would say, a, a difference in a well-meant shortcoming and a stupid and heedless blunder. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first, is, if, if somebody's made a mistake uh, once, that, that may, maybe ought to be treated differently than something that would signify something more chronic. And I, and I would think that perhaps a $100 fine initially and then within a year, there's a subsequent occurrence up to the $500 fine as a potential avenue to, to create a little bit of a, of a difference there. Well, if I might, just to clarify your point, um, there's going to have to be a knowing and willfulness requirement as a part of a charge in the instance where this would apply. So if there's an accident uh, or, or a simple mistake, then the ordinance wouldn't apply and it wouldn't penalize a person who made a mistake. It only applies to folks who willfully and knowingly violate the law and create the danger that's imparted here. I, I still think the, the difference is, and I'm thinking, you know, for, for instances all over the county, somebody up in the ridge just doing some target practice, shoots on the neighbor's yard and uh, you know maybe they didn't know that they didn't have permission or I mean just something that would allow some type of if you do it again right that, that's more serious than, than the first occurrence and so that, that's something that I would, I would think would be good to have. so a graduated enforcement scheme on the civil side yeah okay how are you making a motion I'd appreciate some comment first I, I mean I agree with me. yeah I mean I, I, I think we could I'm not wedded to those numbers if people have different ideas I'm inclined to agree. Um, and we just received a, a number of items that I, I, we, I think we said we would take a look at, and we don't have time during this meeting to take a look at it. So uh, um, I'm inclined to agree. A, a graduated scale does sound like it make more, makes more sense. Guys on this side? Probably just questions or comments? Yes. Well, I guess the only comment I really have considering our ordinance, uh, is there an ordinance in the state of North Carolina that covers this? Yes. Not to my knowledge. Uh, uh, we just got some information today that makes me think that that's, that's true. And, and I've seen the same item presented several times, and, and I, I think I clarified this a few weeks ago. You but did. I'll speak to it again and say that Thank the you. ordinance that's presented in the packet that the board received during the comments today, uh, item number three of that packet, appears to be a copy of Administrative Code 15A 10D period 102. These are the rules that apply to ranges that are operated by the Wildlife Commission, right. that are owned and operated by the Wildlife Commission. There's no statewide uniformity in terms of those uh, rule was applying to any privately or other publicly owned range, only to the Wildlife Commission ranges. Thank you. <coughs> uh, um, the way I see it is uh, Brad Range is doing everything that they are supposed to do, but they make noise, and the neighbors don't like the noise. So that's the issue. It's kind of like the racetrack. And people live across from it. Until you get electric cars, they don't like the noise. And we are in neighborhoods together sometimes, beside each other. I grew up around farms. They make no noise, but they had a nice aroma. And you just, it's just where you are. And I mean, I hate this for everybody, but I just, um, we can beat this dead horse the next meeting. We'll come back and we'll see a sentence that we don't like or we do like. It's constant. I think we need to make up our minds. Mr. Chairman, one additional comment I'd like to make. Yes. This is not the first time this issue has come up, and it hasn't always been just pertaining to the red range. So it's not a first occurrence before the board. It's the first 
probably the first occurrence before this board. But in my five years, I've seen it come up probably at least twice. So, um, and that was people shooting out of their backyard range or something of that nature. I don't recall that it being in the past um, being from a, a private gun range. So, or public gun range. I don't think there was a public one. But in any case, um, yeah. Mr. Turner, are you inclined to make a motion or carry it over to the next? I would defer to council's comment on that. Um, I, I think the best thing for me to do is to take this under advisement. It sounds like there's uh, some, um, well, uh, I've heard both sides of this, honestly. Um, so I think maybe the better way to, to handle it be to make a motion and then vote on whether or not you want me to reconsider and revise um, some of the language that we had talked about or you had spoken about, Mr. Turner, related to a graduated scale for enforcement. If that's what the board wants to see um, and that motion carries, then I'll be happy to do that. We'll print it in at the next meeting and then that'll be the first of two considerations for the ordinance. Um, if it doesn't carry and the board wants to vote today, then I guess that's appropriate as well. Very well. I, I won't endeavor to give you the exact language, but uh, the motion would be to amend Section 8 so that the first offense would be punishable by a $100 fine and subsequent offenses within a year of any previous violation would be punishable by a fine. Just to clarify what you're asking for, so right now there is uh, there are two enforcement options. There's a misdemeanor enforcement option and then a civil enforcement option and each of those is applicable depending on the preference of the deputy who's handling the enforcement. When a civil remedy is sought. Okay. I'm just curious. I'm not a lawyer. Why, why, why the difference? Um, I mean, well, I'm just wondering, more, like, you know, I don't know if the sheriff, I'm just taking the sheriff deputy as, as, as an example here, and he comes out. I don't expect him to know at, <coughs> at how, how you and Craig know as much about the law as the deputy would. So I'm just curious, how would he make that distinction? Uh, that's a really good question, and it's one that the deputies have to decide based on the, the, the totality of the circumstances they're dealing with. Um, if the parties seem to be intoxicated and this is going to be the best way to handle this situation would be to potentially make an arrest, uh, then that might be a viable option depending on the circumstances. But if we take the misdemeanor option out of play, then that eliminates the ability for an officer to make an arrest depending on how egregious the situation might be. And typically on a class two misdemeanor, it would be a citation rather than an arrest, wouldn't it? Typically, yes. I'm, I'm not interested in the sheriff's comments on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let me just say this. You know, uh, it's a willful violation. And I talked to uh, Rudy. Rudy was going to take whatever that ordinance was, put it when his people joined. They have to read it and sign it. They understand it and go on. Anybody that willfully shoots into another man's property and stuff like that, gentlemen, you know, I have a problem with it. And I have been down there and looked at that range. He has made some corrections. Now, do I, I agree with everything? No, but he's tried to, to do that. And it gives our officers an opportunity. If you get called down there and somebody has just willful done it, then they need to be charged. And if Rudy allows it, he needs to be charged. But if he didn't allow it, <laughs> You know, if you understand what I'm saying, we're getting called this stuff, and people don't understand why we can't make an arrest. We have no teeth to make an arrest or do anything on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And hey, I'm going to say Second Amendment man all the way, but I went down and looked, and you know, we saw the trees where it had been shot into and stuff, and he's trying to make some corrections, but. If we get called down there again, I'm going to give y'all's telephone number because mine rings all the time on account of this. <laughs> uh, and we got to have some teeth to, to be able to, to enforce the law. And if, you know, and if, if we're not, then we're wasting our time here. So I'm making an assumption that you're for this ordinance? Sir? I'm making an assumption that you're for this ordinance, the way it's written? I'm for that ordinance, the way okay. it's written. Thank you. I mean, y'all don't have to agree with me now, don't you? <laughs> but I, I'm just saying. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, I mean, as it's written, you've got, you've got the option of a, of a 
of a misdemeanor with the, an arrest or a citation and and or civil. So I, I think <clears throat> I still I, I guess I stand by my motion. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. No problem. You still have the option. I'll second. Any other discussion as to this motion to have a graduated scale? Is the do the misdemeanors add up to a felony? No. no. Okay. But you can just misdemeanor all day long. Misdemeanor all day long. What's the point? It ain't fun to go to court. So, well, well, then, well, yeah, it isn't fun. I mean, I understand that, but I just, um, I don't know. Mr. Thompson, I don't think we have the authority to uh, to create a felony. No. We don't. I guess in theory, and this is a hypothetical, but um, habitual misdemeanor offender, um, if you are convicted of enough misdemeanors in a certain period of time, don't quote me on the time frame, um, that could be a felony. So I guess in some ways, shape and fashion, it could become a felony if a person were to be convicted of a misdemeanor enough times. I'm not sure that applies in a situation where the misdemeanor in question is an ordinance violation. Um, but in theory, and I'm happy to study that issue for the board. Well, in fact, if you shoot and hit someone, or there are all kinds of ways that it could become a felony, Correct. But, um, uh, any of the crimes that normally are attendant to shooting into an occupied vehicle, an occupied residence, those are all felonies. So depending on what other state level crime might apply, those are all felony crimes. The, I'm just going to say this. This has gotten personal with the neighbors, some of them who don't like this, and, and that can get out of control really quick, really quick. And that I do not want to happen. And um, that's always a plug for zoning, you know. But I'm just saying, we just, um, I hate for us to dissolve a problem that's between two entities when I think they need to get at the table and work this out somehow. Because um, no matter what we decide, somebody's not gonna like it because that's just the way it is. You know, we got 10 commandments, we don't obey them. So this right here, I'm asking about the misdemeanor. You know, how many misdemeanors does it take to get? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, just stuff like this can really get out of control, and um, and that's the problem. I just don't want folks to let their emotions get the best of them because in this world it can happen. Everybody's under so much stress, and that's the last thing that I want to see happen. Because they both sides are important, and I respect both sides the way they feel. To clarify for the board, um, in order to qualify as a felony some or all of the misdemeanor uh, convictions underlying the felony charge have to be assaults. This would not qualify as an assault. So any number of violations of this crime that we're creating would not qualify as a felony. We have a motion on, on the table and a second. Any further discussion? You said $100, right? But still got that misdemeanor up there, right? Yes. Yeah, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. You voted no? I did. Okay. Just ask. Okay. There will be a second reading. A third, I should say. Yes. So based on, yes, based on this, there'll be a first reading and then a second reading. So we'll hear about it twice more. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Let me make a short, short statement. I apologize to everyone. Um, earlier, um, I had a blood, blood sugar reading. That's why I was eating the cookie. Um, I understand there were some complaints that I was eating. I was not trying to disrespect the speaker. And for that, I apologize. Thank you. Hello, hello everyone, um, commissioners and, and um, Alamance County leaders. My name is Kara Doner. I'm with Via Health, and for those of you don't who don't know, Via is one of six managed care organizations that manage Medicare, Medicaid in the state for people with intellectual and, de and developmental disabilities, substance use disorders, and foster care. Uh, and I come to the county uh, quarterly to give an update on um, how Al Alamance County is performing. And before I get started, I do want to let you know that I have uh, my colleague here, Lori Whitson, who is the director um, of criminal justice and, and crisis 
um, services for, for VIA. She is in charge of the Diversion Center operations, and so she's going to step in after my presentation to answer any questions about the Diversion Center and give a quick update. Uh, but I will say, I did, I did get a chance to, to talk with Mr. With Mr. Millis. Willis. Willis. Willis, thank, thank you. Um, and I had, um, like uh, Commissioner Thompson, had seen him in, um, at the, the county commissioner's conference, and I didn't get a chance to hear his presentation. I had to go do something else, so it was, it was nice to hear it. But there, you know, there are things that we can do to work together. Um, he, I already saw some ideas that we can piggyback off of because there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. And I will say that um, at least two other counties that I work with are looking at hiring a coordinator with part of their opioid settlement money, which I think will go a long way. So I'm gonna work with him and talk to partners about how they've appropriated some of that money and the funding, um, and I'll report back on that to you all. Um, but you know there are some alarming rates um, of, of what's going on and, and it really is important to connect the dots around the community and you know suicide is just to give you some quick stats it's the number one cause of, of death in Hispanic and in young Hispanic people um, it's third in the Native American population and um, uh, there's been a 44 percent increase in opioid addiction and in, in, um, in black men across our country and so you know there are a lot of different things going on but I will say I'm encouraged about sustainable Alamance I just have to do a plug for them uh, with reentry services um, I was told I, 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 I am going to be on their steering committee and I was told that they are looked at as eighth in the state for getting a reenter council formed and that's rare I mean that's usually in really really big counties I know this is a bigger county, but um, you know the Wakes, the uh, Mecklenburgs—they have been first in that. And um, you know there are ten times more people who have mental illness in prisons than in institutions. So to make sure people that are coming out of incarceration are prepared to succeed in society, I think is key in a in a thriving community. So okay, I'll say that and I'll be done. Um, so I'll get going on just just giving some um, numbers on how Alamance is performing. So you can see um, members served by age and disability type. So at the bottom, um, IDD is intellectual and developmental disabilities, mental health, and then substance use disorders. Um, so you can see um, we serve the most adults and the kids are in orange. Um, so there's quite a bit of, of people being served under Medicaid in Alamance County. Here is a breakdown, this is a great pie chart. It shows you just kind of where the funding is going, where the services are going. Most is in outpatient. Um, you can see 176 on that, uh, that blue slice for in the innovations waiver. So that is how many people are receiving, are receiving that service in Alamance County. Um, you can see you know, the other, other services broken down. But um, yeah, outpatient is the, the biggest service for children and adults. And I'd just like to show this slide so you can see kind of where your, where your big providers are performing here. Um, you know, you can see the top five. Um, and RHA, of course, being um, the biggest provider working with the Diversion Center, but um, quite, a bit of quite, quite a few people are being seen by those providers in the county. And here is kind of a breakdown of the innovations waiver. Um, so the Innovations Waiver, is it's an amazing service that people um, get on a list to qualify for treatment. So that, and that treatment could be anywhere um, about, it's about $120,000 a year, and that sounds like a lot of money, but compared to having someone institutionalized, it's, it's a deal. Um, so I've mentioned before that the, the, the General Assembly is continua, continually allocating more slots for that because there is a long waiting list. <laughs> Um, you know, I think we have 15,000 people on the waiting list right now across the state, which is, which is, is too bad. Um, but I always like to show how many people are receiving those services. So the people who actually have the services are on the blue slice there. People who are waiting are on the, on the registry list right there. And so, um, and you know, the registry has, so has some great services. They have job placement services um, and other services that people can get while they're waiting for the registry or for the for the waiver slot. Oh gosh, I just turned it off. Good. Okay. Next slide is care management. So, so uh, we have a care manager for people receiving services at VIA. So I thought it'd be kind of neat for you to see 
how that's broken down um, with the IDD population, mental health and substance abuse. And you know, you can see this with kids and adults. So that's kind of an interesting slide to see where that breakdown is. Here's the community hospital inpatient figures. You can see um, you know, the, re the readmits are in orange. Um, mental health is in blue. And that's the same kind of slide for substance use for the readmits. That's pretty low for this county. And here are, it's just a quick slide to show you um, the community hospital inpatient facilities where people are going from Alamance County. Um, so this those, is, this oh, yeah. is ARMC, is that correct? Yes, okay. yes, that's the, the, that's the top one. These are just other, you know, other facilities across the state where Alamance residents have gone. And here is the follow-up after discharge for Medicaid. You can see mental health on the left, substance use is on the right. And just so you know, kind of, um, you know, the state likes to have the follow-up rates at 40% at or above, and you can see um, that we're pretty high on, the, on that list, way over 40%. So I can take any questions, um, and, if, and if I know we're kind of running behind, we don't have any questions, I can have Lori come up and give a quick update on the Divergent Center. Any questions? I think we're good. Okay, wonderful. Hello. Thanks. I was say good, good morning, but Hello. it's now it is a good afternoon. <laughs> So in the middle part, so as Kara said, my name is Laurie Whitson. I work um, with network development, actually work with Donald Bruce, um, and I support the crisis system as well as the criminal justice ser services system. So where the crisis, when people are in crisis, building up the network there, but also a lot of those individuals are also involved in the criminal justice services system. So it's a natural fit um, that I wear both hats and help support the network. So I'm leading efforts from VIA to support your Alamance Diversion Center. Um, and it has been, it has been a joy. <laughs> it has been a joy. Your county and the people involved are just so passionate and have just pulled up their sleeves and have really gotten, really gotten to work. So we started with a design build committee, I'm gonna call it, um, that really started giving input and feedback to the architect as well as the builder. So now that the architectural and the builder, we meet with them, um, Biden meets with them every other week. And then the design build committee was meeting the week between. So it was this flow of information to be able to brainstorm, get feedback, and the members of that group have been um, Moses Cone, the Sheriff's Office, Burlington Police Department, as well as some of the subject matter experts that came to you and actually um, came from the work plan over. So that group of individuals, we're now shifting and moving into a operational, looking at operations, looking at the services, looking at um, what's going to be in there, what are the relationships going to be in that facility, looking at the actual service system, and looking at um, some of the information that actually I think Donald brought to you all, um, dusting that off, bringing it up, and reorganizing that. And then um, my understanding is that there will be a work group scheduled um, for the county commissioners that you'll be invited to where we'll actually provide a formal presentation for you all. So that's kind of where we are. If you've driven by the site, it it is coming together, although it's yellow. <laughs> when, you tie back, when you look at it, it's yellow. You see it. Um, but it, it's really taking, it's really taking a a lot of shape and um, the architectural piece it's been through the engineers approved by the engineers they're they're moving on it 
So, you know, you said earlier, fall beginning, it's still on track, which is, knock on wood, that continues, but yeah, it's on track. I was at the hospital all weekend. That, boy, that emergency room is something. And um, they can see it across the parking lot up there. So if it's yellow, Oz was green, so it's okay. <laughs> it's, out okay. it's that whatever that yeah it's a shiny star that's where we go yeah, yeah. it's it's a center of hope mm -hmm. it's a center of hope for sure mm -hmm. uh, just one question thank you Mr. Chairman um, I commend you guys on getting to where we are so far the building is definitely taking shape I think it's going to be a great addition for, for the county uh, I, I just uh, it's now important to focus on the next phase which is getting the services in there that yep. are going to be operational so yep. that when we do have uh, you know ribbon cutting that it's as fully operational as it can be yeah absolutely absolutely and um, what I was hoping to share during the work group is a timeline so that everyone's real clear about the expectations yep. of services what is going to be out of the, what is going to be operating out of the gate like that ribbon cutting you're coming in and then what in terms of licensing pieces of that. So that's the next step is to getting that in a presentation form for you all to be able to, to look at that. That would be great. Because there could be some significant lead time if, if we have to do contracts with different providers, if, you know, License. whatever, licensure, licensure. those kind of things. So we, we definitely need to, to have an idea of what that's going to look like as quick as we can. You know, do we have, you know, yeah. somebody from the health department who kind of connects with the Surrey County model? Do we not? Those kinds of, yep. of issues and who's in those spaces it's very critical. The quicker we can make those determinations, I think the better we'll be uh, when we cut the ribbon. Yeah. yeah. Who's on the seat of the bus? Right. <laughs> that's, that's, it's important. That's, like, that's kind of yeah. Those are important seats. Yeah. Those are important seats. Critical seats. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I drive by the facility probably a drop dead minimum two to three times a week, so uh, it it probably seems slower to me because I'm seeing it so many yeah. times, but. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I can't wait to see it, see us get it up and get it operational. That's going to be a great that's going to be the key. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have no questions, but thanks for your uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Very, very informative. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have been been by there not within the last week, but I was out there at six six thirty one evening two weeks ago. They were still working. I was very impressed. We had a great builder. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, the um, the partnership, the partnership has been amazing. You know, it's it's not the like you didn't know with the right hand. It is in sync, Patico. As to the contract, we already have RHA and several providers in place. Now, whether Patico continues these contracts or not, that's up to you guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've done a really good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? We appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Hook. Can you just keep on going, I say. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, Chairman, Mr. Paisley, uh, members of the board. My name is Greg Hook. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Alamance Parkland School System. I have uh, five items on your agenda today. The first item I have is uh, sharing our um, current uh, status on our uh, capital reserve plan. Uh, this slide uh, that I have created shows each of the uh, current projects, their location, and also uh, uh, how much funds have been spent. Um, and also sh shows the current budget. Uh, I do have one agenda item later on around the AW, Alexander Wilson traffic project. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to share future years. The, the agenda said current status, but I have some other slides if you wanted to see. No, is this bond money? Or is no, ma'am, this, this is capital, capital, capital reserves. Okay. Oh, there was a question earlier about looking at it from a, at the future. Oh. 
four or five year plan. I think you come up with a four year plan. You yes. might want to explain yes, that and uh, maybe present briefly what those are in each of those years. Yes, sir. It was suggested uh, when I first came on board to create a five year plan and a 10 year plan. And honestly, when my team started looking, once you get out past four years, uh, you don't know what tomorrow holds. And so uh, I, I stopped at four years. I do have some suggestions for the for the future, uh, and uh, I'll just go through each of those slides. This slide I've listed as year two. It doesn't infer that this is necessarily 23, 24. This would be what I would call the unfunded group or the next group of priorities. Uh, so those are listed here. Uh, I will mention at the, the top, I have a couple on here that we have some other other ways to take care of these items. Uh, the first item is a new well and pump house that's needed at Sylvan. Uh, I have a, a repair um, um, request later on in the agenda. If that's approved here and is approved by a DPI, then that would come off of this list. But that's much needed there. The well keeps running dry down at Sylvan. Uh, the second item, uh, the sewer line replacement at BEJ, I have that in uh, the 23-24 uh, plan for the PAYGO SIP funds. So uh, if I get that taken care of with those funds, then it would come off of this list as well. Before uh, you go one step further, is that the, the little thing in the fence that you go to the ball field? The sewer line, the thing there at B at Jordan? Because I was down there taking pictures of the field and all that stuff down there. and. That was there when I went to school at Saxby Hall before the Ever Jordan. And so is that what you're talking about? Because I'd asked John Jordan about that as well. Is that the sewer stuff? You know which one is right across the street from Morris Chapel. I, I can't speak to what, what you're saying. We have a terracotta sewer pipe, which terracotta will, is, will bust and it's under the ground. Okay. And so when it has a break in it, we have to go repair it. And it's, it's old and terracotta is yeah. not, not viable these days. Okay. So we need to do some work there. Just a quick, one, quick question. Um, I understood, we're talking about year two, that this was, I, I did infer that this was 23 24. Yes, sir. And that this was essentially a budget request in for that fiscal year. So is that is that not correct? Am I not thinking about that right? I think it needs to be. I've, I've only been on the job for two months, so I've been trying to kind of unravel and determine uh, current needs and uh, future needs uh, with so many capital uh, 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 projects in play on the current year. I wasn't sure uh, what your board was interested in doing as far as moving forward. I, I thought it might be uh, you know, concerning to have so much capital tied up all at one time. But these, these things are needed. I think um, um, there's still some uh, some things on this list that could be pushed back to to the next year as as we continue to determine um, you know what's what are the the utmost priorities. Are these ranked in order by top to bottom on the screen? By by page, but not necessarily on on that on that on that page. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So we do need to do. Uh, um, an RFQ for a mechanical uh, and electric, electrical engineering design company. Right now, the items that we have on here for HPAC, I wouldn't be comfortable uh, going out to an engineering design company now. We need to do an RFQ to, to find a priority uh, engineer design company to use for those. I don't, I don't want to interrupt too much of the presentation, but I think it would be really helpful to us to have an actual rank, or at least a group of ranks. Um, I mean, I think the Western Middle, Western High, Beaver, Jordan, Roofs have been one, two, three in that order uh, in, a, in a prior you know, version of you. So uh, if that's changed, I just think we need to know that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sort of a rack and stack of, of this particular screen to know what's actually the priority. Yes, sir. And, and the HVACs, this is not under your ESSER funds? No, ma'am. The ESSER projects that we have are for. Uh, clean air, fresh air, um, these these are separate from that. Okay. Can I give you some insight on that, Ms. Thompson? Thank you. The school board voted 10 million to give $10 million to the teachers and they took it out of that account. Okay. Just telling you, that's how it happened. So, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Bill. That two and a half times four, those HVAC projects were uh, actually voted by the school board to take the money out of the HVAC program and give it to the teachers as bonuses. And now we see what the taxpayers have in their, in their lap. So just want to tell the school board that 
some of their uh, actions do have consequences. It was not only for teacher bonuses, but it went to other employees as well, did it not? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody got a little piece of that, and now here we are holding it back. Just saying. I'm glad to go back and, and prioritize on this page and, and each of the pages and that's what's, what you all would like. It may be harder as you get farther out, but particularly it is. It does. for the immediate concerns. Yeah. It is. And it, 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 you might take Mr. Lash's comments into account on that prioritization, I would, I would think. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, this next slide that I have labeled year three, uh, the top one on here, Grand Middle School, I did sit and meet with our entire HVAC team at the maintenance shop. And uh, they agreed that the ones on the front page were necessary, but then when they saw I had Graham on this page, they said, well, it's the worst. So we do need to do some prioritizing to get them in the, in the correct order. If you go through the slides, when you get back in here to this last uh, last slide, you'll see that it, the estimated budgets are quite a bit less than the, the prior three. We have them stacked up at the front. Quite a few more expensive things. I know, that's off the top of your head. I know that's almost rude for me to say that. Can you just, do you remember or what are the HVAC systems that your ESSER funds have helped with? Because see, I look at it this way. That air, <laughs> It was the same air before COVID as after COVID. And it's important that kids are breathing clean air and no mold and stuff like that. So I think it's just almost funny how the federal government thinks COVID money is going to clean up air that's been in the school and after. I mean, I, it's just ironic to me what a priority is to our federal government. Oh, well, now we think your HVAC should be better. Not that before they were, but regardless of COVID, I mean, anything like that, it's just almost hypocrisy, but which ones have you done? We have, we have uh, eight schools uh, okay. that are, um, uh, we're working with SAMIT. We expect yeah. the GMP uh, in the next week or two around these eight schools okay. and the uh, ESRA projects to improve the air quality in these right. schools. Okay. I'm glad to read you the name of the schools. If, are they the higher schools or the middle or the it's school? It's just an array, everything? and okay. I'll read them to you. Thank you. Um, so the entire project uh, we think is going to be around $26 million. Williams High School, Broadview Middle School, Turntown Middle School, AO Elementary School, South Mevin, East Long, Elementary, Western Middle School, South Graham Elementary School. Okay, thank you. And that's an array of HVAC project, projects that also includes uh, windows as well. At turn time. In yes. several locations, <laughs> thank yes. Thank you. But it doesn't, okay. since you mentioned it, it doesn't include complete windows. Gotcha. So in some of these slides, you'll see where we have windows in these slides, which would complete what would have been part of the ESRA project. We just have to realize the vastness of how many school campuses there are. It's not like fixing the windows in my house, but still, it's just enormous. Okay, thank yes, you. And are they almost complete or in the process, or getting ready to be? <laughs> getting ready to be. Okay. We expect our, our GMP in the next couple of weeks, and then we have to take a contract to our school board okay. in order to, to proceed. Okay. And this, this project is huge. Uh, so we have some things occurring this summer, but it would be strung out through the school year and on yeah. through next summer. It's hard to remodel with thousands of kids walking around. Well, that and the supply chain and just yeah. getting some of the things that we need is going to be very difficult. Is there a, you mentioned that that project is huge. Obviously, we've got the bond projects going on. We've got the top 10. We've got the ESSER HVAC. We've got these requests. Do you reach a point where your office is limited in the number of projects that can handle? I think so to some degree, and I'm glad you asked that. I think it relates back to how I had labeled year two and made some assumptions that maybe you, because when you look at the current year, current year goes back almost a year and a half, and it looks like it's going forward a year. I think this, the same kind of thing is on my mind when we're looking at, um, and we'll see another presentation at the end. My fifth item is the, kind of the bond status review. Lots of the things that are happening there fall on the uh, operations office to handle and, and carry out. <coughs> we're trying to uh, complete punch lists and get lots of things closed out. It's really gonna pile up during the summer. So I think um, it, 
you can't have too many or too many of, uh, of the same type and it, and it just makes it difficult to follow them all. Uh, this last page, uh, I've had lots of questions on this one. I don't have a year on here. These are just things I wanted folks to know about uh, that are not necessarily on the front, front four pages. Um, the top, those are just some suggestions, things that we should be aware of and look at. Um, we, we have some situations where we're at capacity or we have lots of mobile units at schools or we may be over, uh, over capacity and, and the students may be tight in some classrooms here. So uh, Elon, we started that at capacity. That was a trade plan with uh, University of Elon, so it wasn't built with any extra space. That building was built for easy add-on, so I just put it on the list because it started at capacity. Uh, Alexander Wilson, we have one mobile unit there, and we're looking at uh, putting some other mobile units there because we, we're not able to, uh, uh, to get the, class, the kids into, into classrooms. We're using every available space in that building. And we need some, um, some more room there. Uh, East Lawn Elementary, they have six mobile units there now. They're all outside the security vestibule, if you want to think of it that way. And just as a, as a safety concern, I think that's something that should be looked at. Uh, Woodlawn Middle, um, because of redistricting, it's going to be very tight in Woodlawn. Woodlawn is one of the schools that was built without walls. And then when they went back in years later, when they figured out that wasn't the, the best idea, uh, some of the spaces it's difficult to get 30 student desks in there. We can get them in there, but they're going to be really tight. Um, we're looking at putting three mobile units down there. We probably won't get them in there until Christmas because we have to move them from other sites, and some of them are currently being used. Uh, but that's still going to uh, be very tight down there, uh, and there's lots, lots of building in that area. So I, I put that on the list uh, as something of interest. Um, I will mention that uh, our county qualifies for the needs-based grants. Uh, we're a tier two county that requires a 15% match from the county commissioners, but we'd be glad to do an application to, uh, to look at any of the things that we have on the uh, uh, capital funding request or these things that we have on this list as well. Um, school safety needs, I have these pushed into the PAYGO SIP plan, the five-year plan, all in the first three years. It'll take us at least three years to get the rest of our security vestibules, cameras, and key card access in place. But I thought if you were interested in knowing um, what it looks like, that's, that's what's out there. Uh, that middle item, the six middle schools, that's just the door access because we have cameras in all but four of the middle schools and those are uh, currently uh, re almost ready to go out to bid. Uh, but that total for the uh, safety is like $3.8 million. That's what's left on the table. And so in the first year of the PAYGO plan, uh, it's 1.8, which is over 50% of the PAYGO funds uh, in 23-24 that we'll put towards that. Um, the next things I have here, uh, athletic program needs. The Western High School track is unusable. A later agenda item is a lottery request for that. Um, Cummings High School track, um, we already have some uh, funds from Senator Gailey for that when we got our bid in. Uh, the first time, uh, well, the first time we put it out to bid, we had no bidders in December. We put it out to begin, bid again in January, and we had one bidder, and they bid $987,000, which was way more than we had. Uh, so we've uh, broken that up a little bit, put it back out to bid, and we expect bids to come in um, May the 3rd, uh, but we don't expect them to come in with uh, the funds that we have available. So we're looking for some uh, lottery funds to supplement that. Um, other items I, I have on here, the Eastern track, uh, Tennis Court, the Southern Tennis Court, and now I found I need to add the Cummings Tennis Court on here too. Uh, they have huge cracks, some of them one inch, one inch wide. You can't, you can't play matches on the courts. But I have those pushed into the PAYGO plan, but not in 23-24, in, in the next year. Just a question. When I was on the board, the USTA, John Walton from the Tennis Center, and some of his committee members came to present, and I pushed for this. We redid some tennis courts because, like you said, there was cracks where you turn ankle. There were trees near, maybe eastern, um, that the leaves were always falling, and they talk about how wet leaves left on. That's just not good for it. Has that already, like, messed up, or was, there, was yes. it done wrong, or what's the deal? Well, in 2017, yeah. I think that's the year you're referencing, mm -hmm. um, funds were secured uh, for these projects. The western track, um, they took the entire track up and they ground up the current 
uh, sorry, track, tennis court, ground it up, made that into a base, and then put new asphalt on top. That one's in good shape. Uh, the southern tennis courts and the eastern tennis courts, uh, they went with the crack fill option uh, and, to, and then to paint. Uh, but in that option, um, the contract says that it's, it's not going to last. So they're likely to come back, and they, they did. And then we have the same situation at Cummings, I found out, since I created this slide. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the last item I own here, we don't have to have these right now, but I put them on there because it matches up with some of the things that the commissioners are doing with the, um, the, the county athletic fields, uh, switching over from wooden poles uh, and, and older lights to metal poles and LED lights. We did find one at Southern High School on the softball field. A woodpecker had made a really large hole, so we had to go put a metal, um, uh, um, I guess you put a piece of cap or something over the pole uh, so we could get through the season, but we have a, a $7,000 price to take that wooden pole down in the summer put another wooden pole back up. They're terrorists. Mm -hmm. They can do it. I mean, them little suckers can just ruin everything. I don't want to be extinct or nothing. Oh, make sure I say that. But I mean, they can be really destructive. Mr. Hope, before you move on, uh, hey, yeah, I know you've done the job about six weeks. Um, I think this is a start. This plan, I think, is a start. Um, I think what we really need to see is the synthesis of all of these requests. You know, so that you've got the the big unfunded requests connected with athletic needs, connected with safety needs connected with expansion needs into a long-term plan, prioritized, um, that matches budget cycle eventually. Um, and so that we think in terms of years, of actual funding, taking into account all the revenue sources that you have at your disposal. Um, so it's an actual plan so that we prevent surprises. Yes. Um, and if we're doing that, I think it creates trust among our boards. I think it creates credibility among our boards and trust with the taxpayers. And that eliminating, you're going to have water mains that break. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to fix those things. So there are some things you can't plan for, but a lot of things that you can plan for. And I think that's really what our goal ought to be as we move forward together in our, you know, with our staff and with our boards to to get some of these, some of these boards to get these things addressed. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but I think that ought to be the, the goal. Yes, I, I agree. Um, the the timing of me coming into this position right during uh, the budget cycle. You know, I'm, I'm learning something every day, and, and um, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. I'm just curious, does the school system in the county, is our maintenance departments big enough, what I mean big enough, to be able to handle the needs? Because, I mean, it's, it's enormous when you have multiple campuses, multiple buildings, and um, like Craig was saying, one thing just, something's always breaking. If you look at your own house, it is sometimes. And I just, are, are we well equipped to handle what all goes on because our buildings are old and you know I've heard chiller and boiler for eight years and I'm just curious as to are we really equipped to get on a maintenance program and really stay just with it and ahead of it because that's really big work and um, if you're if we're not we don't have enough people it can, we're always chasing that rabbit so to speak and I'm talking about us county and school system I mean it's multiple places we have to serve and it's like he's always talking about, you know, the top ten that can change from Monday to Wednesday, depending on what blows up or what doesn't. And I'm, I'm just curious: are we are we equipped to handle what all we say we do? Or are we always just trying to catch up? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. We have good, very good people. Oh, I know. And uh, they're very knowledgeable. And they know how to fix all of the things. Uh, when I arrived, we had 11 vacancies in the maintenance department. Wow. And it's, it's uh, I, I think similar to the rest of the economy, uh, we're competing. Uh, on wages uh, in, a, in a job market where the unemployment rate is 3.4%. Three, 3. Mm -hmm. So we have picked up a few people uh, in recent weeks. But once we get fully staffed, I think we'll be fine. Gotcha. We can manage uh, the breakdowns, the troubleshooting, and the repairs, and summer projects with, with the crew we have. The things that we have on this list, these would be all items that we would contract out. Okay. Just want to make sure we're all, we're all covered because we all expect to be. Mr. Carter, I think you want to accept Mr. Turner. Yes, I, I, Pam brings a good point. Um, do we have capacity between county maintenance 
and ABSS maintenance for one to pick up slack in the other and vice versa if we run into problems? Is there any capacity there to do anything like that? We do not have that capacity within our maintenance department, no. Mm -hmm. Isn't it Buddy Watson? No. I think I asked him that one time. He, he did does capital projects mind. for us. It's Joel. No, 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 we're good. I mean, this, I, I don't think none of us have an idea of how massive it is because it's just constant all the time. Correct. Mr. Carter, you're up. Uh, well, that was my product. Pro pro when, when Pam brought it up, I've been thinking the same thing. I mean, um, These numbers are, I mean, these numbers are unbelievable. Uh, there's millions of dollars out there. It's like a whole nother bond project. And that's, I uh, don't think we're ready for that, so. Uh, Mr. Lashley. Um, I'd just like to echo what uh, Commissioner Turner had said about making sure we have a plan and sticking to it. Um, not really wanting surprises. Uh, there's a couple of things on your list that I didn't know anything about, and I go to the school board meetings, and I yes. never heard anything about, heard something about a Cummins track from the coach. Never heard anything about Western Alamance. I, I had some parents call me and say, hey, can you drive out here and take a look at this? That's when I knew it, uh, because it was on your list. So it's stuff like, like Mr. Turner was saying, if we could have, uh, a maintenance plan that we can rely on and like he said there's things that are going to come up you're going to have things that's going to break and you're just going to have to fix it at the time so that's going to push your priority list back probably but that's that's not a, that's not uncommon but I just want to uh, tell you that I think that uh, you've been given a very difficult job very difficult and I think you're doing yeoman's work of how you're going through the process to get that process a little more lean and mean so to speak but um, I think you are the right man for the job, and I just think you just got to uh, you just got to have some time. And I think uh, with the summer coming up, you're probably really looking forward to seeing how much work you can get done in those those two months. Yes, but sir. like Mr. Turner said, I just want to make sure uh, you know that we don't give you too much money that you can't use. We want to make sure that you know everything's in the pipeline and everything's working as smooth as possible. But just to uh, have a little bit more of an inclination of what's what's around the corner, what should we be looking for, or what's the next thing on the list, so to speak. But, uh, yes, sir. keep Thank up the good work. I'm gonna add to what Mr. Turner has asked for. I'd ask that you come back relatively soon with a spreadsheet in the order of your top item, next item, all the way down with the top item on the top so we know what those items are. Uh, if you need to break them up or over years, show us that. And also show us what monies have already been appropriated for those projects, how much of that's been completed, how much of that has been spent on the appropriated monies. So we know really if this amount was given to you in whatever year, 2022, 2023. Go back to the camera systems and we gave you expensive monies for that more than a year ago and my understanding is from the oversight meeting basically nothing's been completed. So um, if money's already been appropriated, we don't need to be in a position of giving you more monies for the same projects. Um, but uh, we need to see it on paper so that we know what we have done, what we haven't done, and what your true priorities are. And I'd ask, not necessarily next meeting or whatever, but soon you come back with that prioritized <coughs> list. Yes, sir. One other comment, if you want. Yes, sir. Um, you, you mentioned that there were grant funds available with a 15% match. Yes, sir. I think you need to list those projects with a total so that we know what kind of 15% number we're looking at and uh, and what the total projects are so we know what we can get done and what it would cost the county to get them done. And are those uh, grants guaranteed or? No sir, they're not. They're not. You would get into the got sort of the lottery, the tier two counties, and hope that you get one. 
The next item that I have is a, um, uh, a capital reserve. Um, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. Uh, a repair and renovation fund request uh, totaling $455,000. Uh, the uh, repair and renovation funding was approved in the 21-22 uh, legislative year. Uh, they provided $300,000 for counties to take care of classroom repair and renovation. Uh, and then 22 and 23, they put uh, 500000 more in there. Uh, they pay it out quarterly. Uh, so currently our uh, balance is $591,000, but you can pre-access the next two quarterly payments so we could access up to $839,000. That's an interest-bearing account. That's where the $39,000 would come from. Um, so I'd like to request that uh, we have access to uh, $250,000 from the r, r fund for the uh, Sylvan Elementary public water system uh, because it indirectly uh, affects every classroom. The folks at DPI said that that would be on the table to be considered for approval. Uh, also for turn time, Middle school tile uh, abatement and tile installation, $110,000 from that fund. Hallfields Middle School carpet removal, $45,000. And then Graham High School window blind replacements, $50,000. Um, and that would all be from the R&R &R fund. And blinds just aren't meant to be pretty. They're about safety. If you got a shooter on campus, those blinds are closed, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we have time to complete those projects. Um, the reason I'm asking for them now is so we could go ahead and send the applications. Uh, you have the applications here. Um, and if we get approved, we go ahead and get uh, POs in place and, and start moving. So by the end of summer? End of summer. These are things that I'd like to complete. Yes, sir. By the end of summer, except for the water project. Now, that would be more lengthy. What is it in the public water system? Because it's on a school uh, property and it supplies the school then it falls under the domain of being supervised as a public water system. Um, so there's more regulation. Is it more just a well though? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. It is, but this would be a well, a new pump house. And we've already looked at where it would need to go and it would need to go across the street. So we'd have to have DOT involved. We, we own the property across the street okay. and then go under the street. That's the sewer. Sewer, yes sir. Referring to I just have one question just to clarify. I, I see that each of your, each of the things you're going to be speaking on today, at the very bottom of our, we have a, a balance. Um, it says we're, the unallocated, unallocated allocated balance is X. You have, um, my question is, is that, so you have a, an account for uh, repair and renovation, and you have an account for um, capital reserve. I'm just going through the list. Of, I'm just going through the things that you have at the bottom of each, like for example, ABS lottery <clears throat> request. I see that the unallocated balance is 2.325 million. I'm just noticing that all of these accounts have different balances. I'm yes, just making sure that's all uniform. Yes, sir. Okay. So the R&R &R, the R &R fund, uh, whenever we do an application to that, uh, we have to do it where our board chair would sign it and your uh, board chair would sign it. And then uh, it would be sent from here to DPI for them to approve. So the the R and R fund is separate. And it's only for classroom repair and renovation. That's all it can be used for. So far, we've never used any of that. That's gotcha. why it has such a value. That's what I was looking at. Uh, and you said something earlier. I just wanted you to clarify. I just wanted you to say it again. So maybe I make sure I heard it correctly. You're saying that in these accounts that you can actually um, access future funds. Only in the R and R account. Thank you. Thank because you. we Thank know that they'll be, they they split the payments into quarters, but they're all equal, and they know exactly what's going to go in there. So they said we could because we wouldn't be pulling from those funds until during the summer sure. after the money's in there. But if they know that the project uh, is something they approve, they let us pre spend it. Okay. Thank Just you. for R and R. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Thompson. No, I was at the m Monday meeting, and it's, you did it. You didn't miss nothing. <laughs> There was no rock 
that you have said something. I appreciate that because it was covered, and and I appreciate that because a lot of times we don't. When commissioners say, "Bring it," we need to know what you need. We want to know everything you need, and when you bring, it, it's like, "Lord, have mercy." I had no idea, <laughs> and that's what it all needs to be on the table because we need to see what we're looking here. It's it's disappointing. I'm not kidding about Elon already need to expand it, but everybody wants to come live here so we can't have school in a tent. And I don't even like double wise because they're a sitting duck. If you got a shooter on campus, when you're in one building, it's different from being in double wide. I'm just gonna say that. I've never liked them. I know you gotta have them sometimes, but I just, I don't care for them. And um, cause kids are out there all by themselves and it's just, I mean the teacher and all, but it's just not like being in the school, so to speak. But I'm, I just wanna see it all because we need to see everything. I don't think we have sometimes, and you just think, what's this, what's this, and then just put it on the table, and then we'll figure out how we're going to do it. So. Well, not only shooters. Praying for you, Greg. I, I, um. <laughs> not only shooters, but it seems like uh, tornadoes have a little radar system of their own, and they just seem to find anything that's metal construction and go for it. So. Dorothy. Yes. Quickly, just as a question, Mr. Does the money from DPI go directly to ABSS building fund, or does it come through the county? I think it sits in a county fund, and then comes the county, and then we allocate it. Okay. Capital reserves. Good capital reserves. It so the renovation and repair fund would operate the same as our state lottery monies. Okay. They would be deposited into a state treasurer's account. ABSS would submit invoices to the county for reimbursement. We would then refund ABSS off of those funds. Okay. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Oh, let me. No, I thought I was saying. <laughs> okay, you're going to have 591000 and change in that account. And then you have future funds that are projected to, to come into that account. What is that amount and how soon? It, it, it should total 839 by the end. Of course, it's still uh, get, uh, you know, earning interest as we speak. So I would expect it to be over 840 uh, And that money doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't expire. So if we don't touch it, this year, uh, we can touch it next year or any time during the year. Um, so I, I, the reason I'm really interested in using this R&R money because we have the 1.8 pushed into Pago to work on cameras and key cards and security vestibules. It, it would keep me from accessing Pago money for, for these these few projects here. How soon will we reach 839? What, what is your time frame? By July 31st. Okay. Thank you. So it's on a yearly basis? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, most to approve. And second. All right. Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying yeah, uh, aye. Aye. Want to say yay or yes, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the next request I have is a capital reserve fund request. Uh, one of the items that I had on the slideshow, uh, the Alexander Wilson uh, traffic parking lot project. Um, we uh, put that out to bid uh, last year. Um, the uh, low bid came in at eight hundred and sixty thousand. Um, the uh, uh, we didn't accept. We didn't. Ever, we never formally accepted the bid. Um, and when we went back to talk to the um, uh, the contractor, they want to negotiate their bid because of the price of asphalt and materials, and they requested a twelve percent bid increase. That's one hundred three thousand dollars that I have listed there. Um, so, uh, but the other piece of this, we couldn't have accepted their bid at 860 anyway because we'd already spent off 33950 on engineering and design fees on that project. So uh, I'm requesting an increase of uh, $136,950 uh, for that project. Now, is that one of those DOT things that they'll pay you back? Well, it's, 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 no, it's not a guarantee. In fact, we had uh, the Alexander Wilson, yeah. the AO, uh, and the EM Holt projects in the, uh, the the March meeting to be considered uh, for the reimbursement, and we didn't get uh, picked for any of those. They'll go back into the June meeting to be considered. I don't know how frequently they'll keep putting them back in, or how long that you could continue continue to put them back in, but it's back in consideration. So there's no guarantees. Well, I know. I think it was 2020. They had a. 750 That's million right. we don't know where it's at situation <clears throat> i hope they found it because we you know i'm sure school systems could use that okay 
Yeah, this stops in uh, Mr. Lashley. We're going this way this time. Okay. Um, I think you, uh, my question was how, how did this happen? And I think you just said it, that it was just, you, you made a request and it was never, it, the, the school system never followed through with the, with the bid. Yes, it was, it was before I took the position, yeah. the, the bids came in, they had the bid tab and the low bid was 860. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then uh, the operations office came here and asked to increase the budget for this AW uh, parking lot driveway uh, to 860. And you all agreed to change it to 860. The piece that was missed was the bid was 860 but they had already spent 33,950 on design, so they should have asked for um, eight, you know, 890. Yeah. Mr. Carr. No question. Mr. Carr. <clears throat> so the original request for the, the budget should have included enough for the design as well, and didn't? Well, the original request, I think, was really low in all, all three of the projects, AWAO and, and, uh, and uh, EM Holt, came back to ask for more funding. Uh, the amount of funding asked in that second go-round was not quite enough to cover the, uh, the design fees, yes, sir. But my hard work on these requests, just saying that it gets a little harder as we go down. Um, my, my trouble here is that this is the third request for the same project. Yes, sir. Uh, if we don't, what, what happens if we don't approve this? We could put it back out to, to rebid. And if we do, we could get lucky or we could get burned. It could come in higher. Um, I can't say. I know you hear a lot about the asphalt index and the cost of supplies, the cost of labor. Um, I can't say where it would go. Can you do a portion of the project? We could look at it. We could. Um, this The particular bidder uh, held a place. We've talked to him said we'd hold a place so we could see if we could negotiate the bid. He's still holding a place to do the work this summer. We could go back and look at, you know, look at this plan with the designer to see what else could be done. The critical thing at AW, and you all know, the 54 and 119, the new school is going up the road, plus all the folks trying to get into Honda at the same time. It's, it's, it's critical to get the cars off the road. And, and the reimbursement, if we get it, will be limited at $750,000, yes, regardless of what we spend on That's right. Thank you. What does this look like? Is this just another lane? Or, like, what's almost no, it's, it, get, it the gets the cars like. off the road onto the AW property and then it okay. would loop them around. Okay. What is the time frame? Uh, uh, the contractor says he could do it this summer. So, uh, the, the things that had to be completed, not that it would be totally complete, but uh, we think that it could be complete enough so it wouldn't impair the ability to get, get cars in and out when school starts. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Any opposed? No. It's unanimous. No, it's not. not. No, it's not. Oh, it is not. I said no. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. You have a four to one. No, thank you. Next. <clears throat> The next request I have uh, is for lottery funding in the amount of $1,145,000. Um, there are different pieces to this request. We're requesting $400,000 to put with the existing money from Senator Gailey, uh, awaiting that bid to come in on that track. We have several alternates in, uh, in the design of that track. There, there are two different pieces to that track. You have the track itself, which needs to be taken up. When we did uh, core drilling with the uh, engineer design company, they found there were two layers to that track. In some places, the total depth of the two layers was three and three quarters of an inch. So the layers were not appropriate to, to begin with. Uh, but it's, it's crumbling underneath and causing the, the rubberized cover to come off. Um, so we have that part, but then we also have drains, uh, two drains that we want to take out and repair, and they have the terracotta pipe as well. Uh, so those need to be taken up and redesigned and then also another alternate that we have uh, there's a four foot pipe that runs the distance of the field it's a four foot metal pipe corrugated pipe that really needs to be sleeved that would be another alternate so we're looking to see how that bid comes in to see which pieces we could do 
but at a minimum, that track needs to be taken up. We need to do the drain work and then, and then put the track back down and run it. Uh, the second piece of this uh, lottery request is $700,000 for the uh, Western Alamance track, which is uh, unusable. Uh, now it has lots of cracks and the rubberized coating is coming off as well. Um, then we have a request here for $45,000 to remove the bleachers from AO Elementary School and put back tip, what we call tip and roll bleachers, which can be moved around the gym. If you want to do a program up at the front part of the gym, you can just move them in. And, and you're essentially moving your seating around in the gym. Mr. Turner, Mr. Mr. this is an example of of a surprise, particularly with the Western track. I mean, that's I didn't. Mr. Lassie brought it up today. I didn't know that West the Western Alamance track was an issue. And that's a seven hundred thousand dollars surprise. Um, now, I feel like we sort of have no choice because you got to, I mean, Western has to have a track program. Um, I, I just think if we had, if we were operating under a plan, that wouldn't be a surprise and we, we wouldn't have to, I mean, I feel like <clears throat> I've been thinking about a roof at Western High School, a roof at Alamance, Western Alamance High School, and trying to figure out how to make that happen. This impacts our ability to do those things. Um, and, it, and it, it it lessens the confidence that I think the public has in the request and the series of requests. Um, but I, I don't know that we have a choice. Um, and the four hundred thousand dollars that's 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 because there are additional requirements over and above the the monies that was coming from the state. Well, yes, uh, I mean, but the tr the track bids that came in in January, we had one bidder. And it was nine hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars, and that was not even including any of the alternates. We felt like because there was only one bidder, um, the, the the price was raised that time. We feel like if we can get it in lower, lower than that, but we don't feel like we're going to get it in for the amount of money that we have left from the uh, the, the, the Senator Gailey's uh, money. So that's what that is to supplement it. I'm not saying we'd spend all of that, but it it, it sets us up so that we can move quickly. The problem with this track is. Um, they're running on it now. It's in really bad shape. Uh, it's not quite as bad as a track at Western, but it, it it's really bad. Can, can those tracks be fixed uh, before school begins next fall? I think it would be a stretch. The best time to start taking those tracks up would be February. Um, we'll have to talk to the, uh, I'd say no for Western, but the, since we have uh, bids coming in for the Cummings track on the third, we could talk to to uh, the person with the bid that we choose and see see what they <coughs> they could do. How about the top for next track season? I would say it'd be close. The the problem is when you uh, start doing the asphalting work in the, in the winter, yeah. you, you can't do it in the cold and you can't do it in the wet. So the ideal time to start that is, is February. And so what was envisioned, I think, if if the the Gailey money had covered the bids that had come in would have been to start in February. And the track coach already had plans this year at coming to, to use the Williams track to run his practices and his meets. And they had kind of collaborated so they wouldn't be there at the same time. So we can always make a plan like that if, it, if the, the project's not finished in time for track season. And what's the immediate, the immediate need for the bleachers? Why, why is that part of this immediate request? Um, well, the bleachers at, at, at AO, if you go to that school and you, you look at the bleachers, and I would imagine they, they may have been put in with the school, they're really old, but they're six feet tall in the back. So when you pull these bleachers out, uh, the top row is six feet high, and there are no side rails, and we can't find that you can retrofit these old wooden bleachers with side rails. So if you have someone that's on the top row or the next to the top row, and they fall off, they're going to fall six feet. So it's not compliant and it's not safe. The reason that they're made that way versus some, if you go to Graham Middle School, the bleachers go all the way to the wall because the egress doors are next to the bleachers. So the bleachers don't go all the way. So they've been that way all these years. They're six feet tall, uh, but we did have someone last year stood up, um, they bumped their head on a basketball goal and then fell off the bleachers. 
There was a lady that fell at turn time basketball game one time. She just got too close to the edge. And I mean, this it, you got to be a knock a mountain climber or something. Now, you told me I kind of like at Hallfields, they've got in their gym, it's that is not wooden. Well, it's it's not just the material, but yeah. they're they're lower at the okay. back. Yeah. Uh, but they they are when modern bleachers when you buy them they have rails on the sides where they need rails and when you pull them out the rail moves and yeah. it's in the position where it needs to be. We have several schools that have older types of bleachers that need, really need to be removed. Uh, and then the way to go, especially in the elementary schools, these tip and roll bleachers because they can be rolled like at AO they have a, a curtain at one end that they can open. Uh, it creates a backdrop for choral programs or any kind of program that they're going to do and then you could m literally move the tip and roll bleachers to face that direction. Um, I said a couple meetings ago that there was some excess funds in the lottery, uh, the DPI lottery funds and, and so I applaud your effort in, in both the R and the R and the lottery funds and, and pulling that money through and getting some of the needs done. I anticipated that we were going to get some roofs done so um, that, that's that's my heart for now but uh, thank you for Mr. Turner. I have to agree with Mr. Turner. I, I can't even imagine that the coaches working out there with the young people don't see this and aren't reporting it to somebody. So it should be coming up to ABSS and to us before we get to the point where it's a critical issue. And I know you're new in this job, so I, I'm not trying to put the fault on that for you, Greg, but. Uh, yeah, this kind of stuff, somebody needs, it, it needs to be, I know you're trying to do that with so many different, I can't even imagine the balancing act you have with all the stuff that needs to be done, but yeah, we can't have schools operating without having the fields and things they need, the tracks, the football fields and ball fields and whatnot that they need to operate with without, no, without having people on them and knowing that they need something. And, letting the people in the responsibility know about it. So we need, definitely need to see improvement on that. I agree. Uh, I have, uh, uh, just as an added note, in the PAGO five-year plan, uh, the, the other tracks, Graham um, and the uh, southern track and the eastern track, uh, in a schedule to have them uh, re recoded with right. rubberized coating, I think that's a piece that needs to be there as well. Now, the, the tennis courts, the two that we crack field, the, the, that it wouldn't have saved them to put a paint on them on a, a regular cycle, right. but on a, tra a court that's been redone correctly, if we have a, a, a recoding cycle through the PAYGO plan, that should preserve them. Is there an argument for using clay courts instead of an asphalt courts? I can't say. I don't. This I don't, ain't Wilmington. Beg your pardon. This ain't Wilmington. I don't know. That's why I asked the question. Mr. Lashley. I have no questions. Yeah, I have. Uh, I've been just talking, so I think you've already. Yeah, I think. Do we have a motion? <coughs> motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last item I have for you is a, uh, uh, a bond fund reallocation request. I have a, uh, a presentation uh, that uh, I can uh, flip through for you just so you can see where we have money left in the different bond projects. So on each of these slides, I've set, set them up similarly. Um, at the top, it just lists the, the beginning funds, the amount that were in each of these product, projects at the beginning. And then the bottom row lists uh, how much is left in each of the, uh, the different uh, categories that we put funds into. Um, and then at the bottom left-hand corner, I've listed it as unused funds. Those are funds that uh, we feel that the school system, system should not be moving around or accessing without uh, collaboration and then uh, votes from our board and your board as well. So this one for example is the uh, Cummings uh, project. The total funding for the project was $10,867,000 uh, but the unused funds right now uh, that were never uh, budgeted in the project 
for $901,000, and that's because the construction budget came in at $8,500,000. Mr. On each of these slides, we listed some things that could be uh, considered at these schools. They're not uh, uh, necessarily on the uh, capital reserve request sheets. A couple of them are at, at some of the schools, but nothing on this one. And we just put that on there uh, for consideration because I think so there's different schools of thought uh, whether uh, at, at the end of all the bond projects, if the money should be spent at each of the schools to which they were designated or if they could be pulled back and reallocated uh, through the county commissioners uh, to cover uh, needed projects. This is the Eastern High School um, picture. Um, so on, the, on this slide, we've listed uh, to be completed and I've put some budget numbers here. At, at each of the high schools, we need to replace uh, all of the cameras so that's on here, and we also need to get uh, key card access in place at the schools. And, and then uh, several of the schools, we need to do abatement and tile replacement, um, but we're doing that in the summer following all, you know, the students leaving and all of the project work going on. Graham High School is very similar to the prior slide for Eastern. Western High School. On here, we do have uh, uh, the roofing, the roofing project listed as other needs at this school. Uh, so that could be a consideration at the at the end of the bond projects when, when you're discussing what could we do with the remaining funds. Did I read somewhere that <coughs> you're going to take a million five from Western to give to Southeast, the new Southeast High School, I, I which has the, a construction have, manager that they guarantee that price? Well, I have it over on the southeast okay. slide. I'm just asking. But the answer is the answer is yes. But I thought when we did the new high school, we had a construction measure like if they went over ten cent or ten million cent, they ate, they ate that. Well, this is it. The the, the the problem that we have on this uh, on this uh, project is there was no budget item for supplying the school, stocking the school. And when I say that, everything from a school school owned band instrument to a trash can in the classroom, to a pencil sharpener, uh, to the books and materials, okay. to football helmets, and so on. So stocking the school, if you look across uh, each of the budget items when this project was funded, um, no line was put in for stocking the school. Okay. So that was the Western School, Western High School. This is Williams. Uh, and this one's a little different because I have noted here that we uh, we need to do camera replacement and door access control here, but we also need to request to move uh, $250,000 from unused construction funds over to uh, construction contingency uh, because we don't feel like we should be accessing construction unused construction funds without the permission of uh, commissioners. But that's to cover the cost of doing the cameras and the key card access. I have all of the requests summarized on the last slide. This is Southern High School. Uh, Southern High School looks a little different, uh, differently because uh, there's a column in there uh, for $1.7 million for county funds for road widening. That include, included road widening and also what we're calling the stacking roads or the long driveways at Southern High and Southern Middle. So together that was uh, $1.7. Back in May of 2021, the school board voted to push that 1.7 into the uh, GFP uh, of the, of the uh, contract, or at least $787,000 of it. So at this project, uh, we think we have $915,000 left of unused funds, uh, and we're requesting to move all of that money over to construction contingency so that we can make sure we have the money to do the camera replacement door access but security walls and gates were not put into this project at the beginning because they didn't think they had the funds to do it. So this would be the one school out of the four that have a similar uh, plan, Eastern, Graham, and Western, that wouldn't have the security walls and gates. Southeast, this is the one that uh, we just, just spoke of. Uh, yet to be completed, uh, the cameras, 
uh, the key card access um, and supplying the school and this is where we're requesting to move it from the Western High School bucket of bond money over to this school so that we could stop the school. Pleasant Grove, um, we have listed here to be completed uh, cameras and door access and then we have uh, quite a bit of tile abatement and tile replacement. We just put an RFP out uh, last week uh, to do all of the tile replacement and abatement at all of these schools that, that need that. South Mevin, it needs roof repair and tile uh, abatement there. So in this particular case, we're asking to reallocate uh, the money from the unused construction funds over to construction contingency so we can access it to fix the roof. One thing you notice about this school when you walk in to this school right outside the main office, you look up and you see all the, uh, the water damage ceiling tiles and you look down and you see the, tile, the tiles, floor tiles coming off the floor. So that's the areas that we're, we're working in. So when we were adding on the, the great big thing in the back, we didn't think about doing the roof at the same time. Well, I think they knew. I'm a girl. That's what I would say. I think they knew it existed. Yeah. And I think the hopes were there would be money in contingency okay. for that. There is money there in contingency that we could, uh, you know, mostly take care of the uh, the tile abatement, which they knew they knew that existed, but that needed to wait until the summer to get the kids out so we could get. Well, I just remember whenever out. Pleasant Grove uh, took one of the pre Ks and moved a wall, and there was good old asbestos, and then it had to be located to another school. I just know every time we do stuff like that, you never know what you're going to find, which can add up to so much more. I'd like to get my hands on a man that thought asbestos was a good idea. So this is just a summary of all of those pages. Uh, if you were to total the bottom left-hand box across all of them, we currently have $9 million of unused uh, funds across all of those projects. Uh, and if you were to total the bottom right-hand box, uh, at the moment when I made all these slides, it would have been uh, $14,800,000 there, uh, but we still have the projects ongoing, so we're still spending away at that $14 million. Uh, so the reallocation requests that I have are listed here, and those are the ones that are listed here under 7G. Uh, we're asking the county commissioners to approve moving money from Williams High School uh, construction funds to construction contingency, Southern High School, construction funds to construction contingency. Southern High School, uh, sorry, Southeast High School, 1.5 million from the Western uh, allocation. And then at South Mevin, moving money from their unused construction funds to construction contingency to finish uh, the pieces that I've listed on those slides. Do we need two votes or one vote? That is one vote for the... Yeah, interesting question. Um, it's all one item. I think one vote's sufficient. All right. I could have swore that when we talked about Southeast, that that was turnkey everything. Well, it was just construction yeah. uh, GMP, which wouldn't have included any of the, the stocking of the school items. But you're correct. Anything that had to do with the school itself or the construction project, it, it was on... Uh, the contractor to take care of. It's kind of crazy building a new school where you're going to sit on the floor. No, no, let me, <laughs> let me just say that it did include desks. Yeah. The 1.5 ask is not for desks or furniture. So the, the, if I was to go back to the to the slide and it has furniture, fixture, and equipment, that was in there for the desks mm -hmm. and for the uh, library shelving, for all the shelving in the school, those kind of things. So furniture and fixtures is taken care of in the, in the GMP. So but what I, is this particular... Yeah. It would be everything that students and teachers need uh, to teach and learn. So we're talking about books, we're talking about football helmets, we're talking about the classroom trash can, uh, everything that you would see inside of the school. Well, I'm talking the library. Yes, everything. Everything. Well, I'm, that takes me to something else. I know I went down to Graham High School the last year I was on there, and their field hut, and it, it got fixed, but I was told that they're current football coach had gotten a grant from somebody that he knew that was a big company to help them with uniforms and really safe helmets you know because I know when Dr. Moffat was on the board she was all about concussions she's a pediatrician my daughter got a concussion at Williams her senior year 
and it was an accident, but it just happened. And I just, you know, I just want to make sure that, like, Graham's helmets are just as good as anybody else's helmets. I get, you know, like instrument, band instruments, we see all the time we have to raise money to get band instruments, and I know there is a fund for everything that you could think to get. I mean, it it's just goes on and on and on. And when you did, that just kind of triggered me when you said helmets, because I went straight back to Graham High School and I thought, because I mean, it, it's just, I just don't want any school to be treated any different than any other school. Yes, all kids deserve what they're supposed to have. This so, includes all the uniforms for gotcha. all the sports. I mean, it's, okay. it's well, really that's daddy's, right? Yes. Okay, Ms. Thompson was first, your second. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jim. I guess what I want to say is, is I'm going to try to be consistent. I mean, listen to your presentation, and I truly appreciate everything you've said today. Absolutely, without a doubt. But I'm trying to be consistent with what I've asked the school system to do, and that is priority list. My first inclination is, is I would, I would rather the money go back into the pot and be used for high priority list, high priority items. See what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Am I make Am I making sense, guys? <laughs> uh, because it just seems like, um, you know, I know these funds were allocated to each individual school, and the project came in under underneath, which is great that you have some extra extra funds, but. It just seems like if you want to take care of the high priority list or high priority items, it would be better to, if you were going to get those is to put them back in the pot and then take them out to take care of those high priority items. What I'm trying to say is like, you know, some of those, those bleachers, $45,000 seems very reasonable for that, but is, is it a high priority? You know what I'm saying? I, I, th I hope I'm saying this correctly, but it just seems like if we just take this money and put it back in the pot and then use it for the high priorities. Now take care of the school that you have, that you were uh, that you were um, allocated the money to, you get that project done, that project's done. And then you can look back at your high priority list and some of that $14 million you could use to, I don't know, go after one of the, the roofs, as Mr. Turner was saying earlier. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just talking out loud here, just trying to be consistent in what I'm asking. And, and what I'd like to do so but it's truly up to this board how they want to take care of it I think good point Bill um, I, thought, I thought the same thing when we heard the presentation the other day uh, that uh, in the uh, capital oversight meeting we put that all back in the bucket and we could use those funds for some other situations once we determine that we've finished each of the projects then take off some of these high priority items and get them cleaned up. Um, we've already got the money available to use that for those projects. I, I would like to clarify, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm interpreting correctly uh, what, what you're telling me. So at, at the outset, the cameras and the key fobs were supposed to be part of the project. So I'm asking right. for that. Those uh, those moves from unused funds. Uh, sure, absolutely. That's that's part of getting the project finished, right? That's what I'm saying. I said that that's exactly what I said. Get the project finished. Take what's left over, and I think this is what Bill was saying too. Get the project. As a, as a, if, I, if I'm getting correct, just let me know, Bill. But finish the project. Whatever's left over, put it in a pot to take and get these other high priority. Because as I understand the bond, once we finish the project, but excess funds can be used for any other school projects and not a specific school once that school has been finished. So that gives us funds we can use to get some of these high priority projects taken care of and put it in a bucket to get that work done. But definitely finish the schools. Well, I think that begs a question, and that is, what is the project? Because when Dr. Thorpe was here in October of 22, we talked about where each bond project stood. Uh, and we had reached certificate, certificates of occupancy for most of them. And we're moving into the final stage of all but I think about three. And then there was a re we had a conversation about when will we know how much money is left for each bond project. And the answer was 60 to 90 days after final completion. Um, and we're, we're 60 to not, we're 90 days past 
final completion for all but I think three of the projects. I think it was Pro um, Pleasant Gar Garden and uh, uh, Eastern and one other. So if that's true, if we, if we reach final completion, then we should be done with the bond projects. But then there's, well, we're not done with the bond projects. So I, what I think we're talking about is, or I think the question is, have we finished the contracts that were originally awarded for these projects? Um, no, not all of them. We're working on punch lists at all of them. And then, and then the three you mentioned, uh, we don't have full certificate of occupancy um, in all places, like at Cummings in the uh, the auditorium area, at Eastern, you know, parts of the cafeteria area, and some of the classroom, the two science classrooms. Um, at Pleasant Grove, we do have a full certificate of occupancy, but they continue to go in on the weekends and work at night uh, to do things. But it, it it's working for the students and teachers. So, so we're not at final completion anywhere. No, sir. Uh, so. Um, and then and that's, other, that's significantly different than yes, sir, I understand. where we were October of 2022. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, can you, can you speak to why? Well, um, I, I'll address the tile and the cameras and the key cards. Those but, things but those were, weren't part of the original contracts, were they? No, they were extra. Pulled, pulled out. Well, I think they were pulled out intentionally so that we didn't push them in so that contracts so, mark For the contracts that we've signed, we finished those. So if I'm not talking about tiles and stuff that was not part of the original right. contract, so just the contracts that we that we agreed to do with the bond project, are those finished? Uh, the, no, they're all in process all with process. punch lists except for uh, South Mebbin. That's finished? Yes, except for the tile and, and then the roof piece, which... Which would be a separate contract if we approve it. Yes, and we've managed that ourselves through our... Our project management so that we're not incurring management costs with those and that's originally why they were pulled out uh, from the beginning the Cummings contract now it did include the, the camera and key card access they pushed it into that project but the rest of them they were held out can we go back to the first slide of this, of this, of this the Cummings <clears throat> um, I'm just trying to get my head around this so that the contract price was ten point eight six seven million, right? That's the, 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 I'm sorry, the budgeted price for that. That's, contract. that's the money that the county commissioners budgeted to that project. And the construction contract was eight point five, which was a savings that we that was a savings there of nine and one. And then throughout the project, we have we've gotten additional savings because the furniture costs less and the testing and surveys cost less than what they were budgeted for. Yes. I don't understand why you're drawing a distinction between. The nine hundred and one thousand dollars in those other buckets, on what what the school system has available to it and what requires county commissioner approval. I don't understand the basis for your distinction. Well, we we felt like uh, the money that was put in construction contingency, uh, FF and E, and testing that we could access that during the project as needed to to meet those needs. This project's still ongoing, so we never know what tomorrow holds if we come across something that might require a change order. Or, or something else, so that money is accessible. But we didn't feel like uh, we should be accessing money that was in the unused category from the outset of the project without the blessing of the commission. So I don't really see a distinction there. I think you have a, a budget for the project, you have savings for the project, and the difference is what is what I agree with Mr. Lashley, and I said that in October, should come back to the pot so that it's, it's, it's divvied out as part of a master plan and, and if a, a wall at Southern is part of the priority and it has a higher priority than a roof at Western Allen or Western or Middle, then that's part of the that's part of the plan, and we can do that. But I don't think we ought to be we ought to be saying that this money stays here, this money stays here. If we've got high priority needs, so we got. No, oh, I agree with that's that. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not asking to to hold it in these. But but I, I think that would apply to all of to all of the savings for any particular bond. <clears throat> yes, sir. My my issue now is now that I understand that these aren't complete. I, I don't even know that we're at this. I don't even know that we're, we're here at a place where we can have this discussion because we don't know if things might happen which might pull more money uh, to what's what we originally contracted for. Um, so I think maybe we're premature. Uh, but I also have some, I share Mr. Lashley's concerns about how to handle this money, which I said in October. Um, so I'm being consistent there. More specifically, um, the allocation of the 1.5 million to Southeast, a quick question. Do we, does, does the bond language provide the authority to provide this money for operations? It provides for them to be able to equip the school. It's okay. not for operations, so they would not be able to use this money for 
utilities, um, things of that nature, but to equip the school okay. with library books, band uniforms, band equipment, things of that nature is an allowable cost. My, my cons other concern there, um, there is a plan to cover the operations of the schools that we set into motion a year, years ago, which is the $1 million every year that goes uh, into the Capital Reserve Fund for operations at Southeast High School. I mean, that, am I right that there's a million dollars that we've been putting in that every year for that goes to operations? So we evaluated that earlier um, when looking at the capital plan. And if you remember, we had that conversation at the board retreat in January, was that to remove that operation piece because that would truly need to be covered through the county's operating budget? Going forward, yes. Going we've forward. Been, we've been putting money up until now into that account. Those that costs idea. were not going to come online until 23-24, so it would have impacted those figures at 23 and 24, okay. the amount that we would pull out of that fund. We've got $6.4 million in capital reserves right now. We have $4.8 million, I'm sorry, 4 .8 million. I'm in sorry. capital reserves. Right. Uh, and estimated to be $9.8 million by the end of the year? Thereabouts, yes, sir. The way I would solve this problem is to take the 1.5 capital reserves, not do the bond reallocation, wait until we have not just substantial completion, but final completion, knows what those numbers are, uh, and then I would say reallocate those numbers back, uh, reallocate everything back in the pot. So we're not talking about money from Western going to money going to projects in Southern. We're talking about putting it all back in, having a reassessment of what the priorities are, and putting the money out based on that. That's what I would do. Uh, can you go over the capital reserves uh, number again? Is that their account? So the capital reserves that I'm referring to is, are the monies that the county holds at the end of the year. Um, that is a combination of sales, dedicated sales tax that is then put to the capital reserve fund each year for debt service as well as capital projects. Um, that balance is $4,869,361.03. Um, in reference to what you were referring to just a few minutes ago, Commissioner Turner, of allocating $1.5 million from that fund to go for the offset of equipping the school, I don't believe that that is going to be allowed because it's not going to be a capital project, meaning it's not construction or renovation. Um, so really the best source of those funds that we have available to fund that $1.5 million is going to come from bond proceeds. Okay, I think I'm last. When will you, your bond projects be complete, the last of the last? We're hoping by the end of summer. Um, so we have our... Uh, um, we think we're going to have our certificate of occupancy at the end of July for the new school. Uh, but I think along with that will still maybe be some punch list kind of things. But we'll be in. That's a big project. Uh, we're working on the punch list now um, at all of the other schools, um, closing up work uh, hopefully through the summer at uh, uh, Pleasant Grove and at Graham and at Cummings. So we're, we're hoping, we're shooting for the end of summer. Um, so you're really looking for December? I wouldn't say you, that. You said I, how many days? I would, well, I, I, you know, like it's been said, I'm, I'm new here and I'm learning something every day. Just looking at the projects we have lined up um, and knowing some of the situations around cameras and key cards, um, the supply chain could affect that. So. You know, if, if we can get these things approved today, these reallocations, our plan is to uh, get with the engineering design company, let's get going with these high schools on the cameras, let's get that into engineering design and, and move that along. We're going to need to do that replacement and get that out to bid. So hopefully in the summer we'd start putting putting all those things up. Key cards, it's a different story. Some, some of the doors in schools, particularly the older doors and the mullion, the centerpiece, don't work with the key card systems. So then we have to order a new, it's not just the door slab, but it's the door system, and some of those, uh, the supply chain uh, doesn't get them to us uh, when, we, when we need them. So key card stuff, could, it could drag on. But the intent is to close out by the end of summer, but you know, just based on uh, being a victim of some of those circumstances, I couldn't guarantee it. Okay, 
I'm, I'm concerned as I think Mr. Turner, Mr. Lashley, and I see Mr. Carter shaking his head. Uh, I'm just of the opinion we need to get those items completed, wait the 90 days that you were talking about, and then allocate these monies. Um, that's just my position. Well, but I, I, feel, I feel like before, uh, it's, it's just we're discussing what to do with all the remaining money. I, I agree with that. The, the things, the current four requests that we have, these are so that we can complete uh, the projects at those four schools, which I think is, is, is a separate issue. Any other comments? More questions? Well, when is the deadline to have an allocation of 1.5 million so that the new high school can operate? Uh, if, if you approve it today, we'll start spending it today. Well, then we're going to have to figure out how we can stock the school. We, all those things that you need for school, uh, we, we wouldn't have access to funds. Dr. Butler. Thank you. Just a quick question, Nolan. <laughs> Mr. Hook, if this work cannot be approved for the $1.5 million today, would we still be able to be on time with the CO and open school? They're referring to waiting closer to completion time. Do we need the 1.5 million right now to make sure we open on time? Well, the answer is yes and no. Um, we we can finish the school without the 1.5 million dollars, but when the kids arrive to school, they won't have the things they need to have school. So we have to have them. That's my priority. Yes. I understand that other items may be negotiable, but I would really uh, ask that you guys consider the 1.5 million to be moved to Southeast High School. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank and you. I had to leave because I don't want to be arrested by Sheriff Johnson. <laughs> so thank you guys so much. Thank you. Good job. Thank hey, you, Dr. Butler. Any other questions? So I just want to clarify what Mr. Turner was talking about and what Ms. Evans was talking about. It's not possible to take it out of the account that we'd like to. We need to keep it into a, the account that makes us copacetic with everybody else. Yes. Thank you. Just to clarify. Just making sure that I've had a lot, a lot of sleep, so I'm making sure I'm listening to things the right way. So we had a plan to put hey, right whole money for operations that we can't use for operations. That is correct. <coughs> Welcome to education. I'm glad you said that because I was thinking. <coughs> okay. Mm. So what's the motion? Motion to move that we move uh, that we reallocate 1.5 million dollars for the Southeast High School um, operations. Second. Any other discussion? Are you additionally saying that we not allocate the other monies? I'm not, but that's implied. Yes. Stated. No, it's not. And that we not allocate at this time any other monies. Thank you. Oh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of seeing the by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Unanimous on the 1.5. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Mr. Bond. We appreciate it. Thank you. He did not walk into an easy job. <laughs> no, you do. <coughs> okay, that completes all the items on our item number seven. County manager. No reports here. All right. Commissioners. Mr. Turner. Mr. Carter. Just an observation I found out this morning that a leader in the community passed away. John Kern, a uh, longtime leader, uh, chairman of the hospital for uh, up until 2013, and, uh, involved in just about every aspect of Alamance County, passed away Friday night. And uh, visitation tonight, Richard Thompson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Um, just a really sad, touchy subject. Whenever we are in a a world where there are alleged accusations against certain people in our schools um, and if certain victims do come forward I just encourage all moms and dads to talk to your children because many times in those situations from working in this field for many years there's not just one or two victims so I just encourage you to have really serious hard difficult talks with your kids because you never want your child to go on and never have disclosed that and carry that burden for the rest of their life it's very important 
Thank you, Chairman. I wish I had more uh, comments because I had made a list of notes in my house, but that's where they are. Uh, but I do have one question. Uh, I, I saw all these things that we're talking about grants and grants writers. How does the county look with its grant writer that we requested quite a bit of time ago and a snafu occurred and we did not, we got the person, but we didn't get the person writing grants. Am I missing something? I just want to see where we are in that process. Have we are, are we actively looking for a grant writer? Or do we have a grant writer that we are, oh, I'm just trying to figure out what's Sure, on. so we have a grant administrator, I believe is the position title that was approved. Uh, initially, he was being funded through some of the ARP funds, and we took that component away to have him focus more on grant um, writing and seeking grants, and so he is working with departments to try to pursue grants. He has a number of grants out there that he's waiting on um, responses for, and he basically assists departments in finding grants that would be relevant for their operations. I know it's a process, and it's a lengthy process from what I hear from the, uh, the school grant writers, but I was yeah, just going to suggest that, you know, the school system has grant writers, sure. and that'd be a great resource to call to, um, to just to pass by what you're doing, what you're looking at, sure. maybe you miss something, maybe they can show you uh, a different way to go just because sure. they have more experience. He, we have lost uh, Mimi, who used to do a lot of the ARP things, so he has actually picked up some of those duties uh, in the meantime in the interim while we have that vacancy. Okay. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just one more, John, I'm sorry. Um, I had, before I got off the board of DSS, I had thought about us looking at not restructuring, but whatever, because I know they have been to some kind of critical states of shortages and different areas and the thing, and one shortage in anything in DS is, is critical. Um, I would like to know where they stand. I guess this will be presented in the budget hearing, but I know um, we have got to really consider having our DSS folks making the same, if not more, than area counties around us, or we're gonna to continue to lose them. And uh, Craig's on that board, and he'll tell you the same thing. When your agency that does crisis is in a crisis, that is not done. We received a letter from DHHS, and also I read a letter that Susan Osborne had done in a USA Today magazine mm -hmm. pertaining to foster children. That is such a serious crisis area across this country. So I would like to know where they're at with their needs and stuff, just because um, you know, waiting a day is, is, is not, uh -uh. I just want to make sure that our county is covered and serving everybody it needs to. There are so many areas in DSS that unless you're in it, you don't even realize what they do. They're amazing, and we have to have them. So I'd just really like to know that's a, a real healthy and important thing for the, an agency like that cannot have toxic environments, and they already work with toxic environments. They don't need it in their side of their building. Yeah, just curious. They're sure. so important. They're so important. Sure. I will try to address an assessment of where they are yeah. as part of the budget presentation. Because I'm, I'm a big fan of theirs. I know we all are. And we just want to make sure they've got what they need. Yes. Okay. Leonardo Penix contacted me over the weekend by telephone. Um, and he was very, very just kind words for the rest of these office and how. He had a crisis. His mother apparently has a critical illness. He's having to take care of her, or is taking care of her. And he asked for prayers for his mother. But also, his daughter is getting a master's degree in Florida. And he had to have an emergency um, documentation for his flight and, and so forth. And the rest of D's office apparently really went out of their way to help him. And, I just think that needs to be said publicly. Um, so, Mr. Penix, we're praying for your mother. Very happy for you and your daughter. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. County Attorney. Nothing for me today, board, except for the motion for closed session. I'll read that now. Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A4, I ask that the board move into closed session to discuss matters related to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement on a tendered list 
of economic develop development incentives that may be offered by the public body in negotiations. I don't anticipate any action after this closed session. Motion to approve. Yeah, motion to approve and second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any votes? It's unanimous. We're now in closed session. Announcing we are out of the closed session. Uh, we're back in the regular meeting. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And leave. <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.